There is a podcast in this forest. Not a podcast that has been recorded, nor one that will be, but any podcast. And the podcasters who struggle here do not exist unless we call them into being. This podcast, then, and all that happens now is outside history. Only the unchanging shapes of fear and doubt and death are from our world. These podcasters that you see keep our language and our time, but have no other podcast but the mind. So that's the opening narration to Fear and Desire. Yeah. Turned even more incomprehensible right. by you putting podcasts in for, for a bunch of things. Look, I'm not saying that totally makes sense. Uh-huh. Just sounds What good. I did or what they say in the movie, this did start. It's black and white. It's an hour long. Uh, fear and desire. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, black and white. Did you watch the colorized version it's on YouTube? Cr- I mean, I was like, what is going on, Stanley? This is cuckoo. Wait, there's a colorized version on YouTube. Really? Is, is that what you watch, Ben? It was on Tubi. Oh, oh, you're right. Yes. And Amazon too. Amazon has a fucking colorized version wow. of this movie. Multiple streaming services have this film colorized. And let me say poorly. The, oh, uh, not I mean, even poorly. <laughs> like where I'm like, am I? On acid. It looks like it was done by some very rudimentary $5 AI, but it's this thing where the color like can't stick to their faces. Like it's smudgy. Oh, this looks so awful. It looks really bad. Because you, uh, you know what I was looking at? Uh, uh, Richard Elfman, colorized uh, Forbidden Zone. Okay. His, his sort of transgressive musical he did with his brother Danny. Uh-huh. That looks really good. Yeah, but it's never a good idea, really, is it? No, but it was done artisanally by the person oh, this, originally. Yeah, this, but this is it so It was done weird. by hand very carefully. This is like, it doesn't track with the movement. No, it's this is awful. And it'll, you'll be on someone's face, and then like gray spots will appear. Like the color will fade in places. Yes, this was a black and white film. It's an hour long. Yeah. It started with that narration, and I was like pumping my fist going, holy shit, am I about to watch like a fucking Kubrick Twilight Zone? Because that intro narration despite not making perfect sense feels very twilight zony where you're like we're dealing with the symbolic idea of war this is no specific war that's ever existed the enemy is the mind and i was like yeah great here we go right and then the movie doesn't really have movie that happens and you're sort of like oh okay there's like there's there's some visual ideas here it's you know sort of Maybe a little bit of a sandbox. You're watching a guy like just start to figure things. I no, I don't know what to say about that movie. But then the poster. You look at the poster, right? Uh, the, poster the poster for is, Fear and Desire. It's got a lady on it. Yes, this is uh, Virginia Leith. Virginia Life. It's got two big quotes. Life Magazine calls her a big find. The wolves are breathless about Virginia Life. Walter Winchell. And then what's essentially a cheesecake shot of her. And then there's a photo of uh, an illustration of her legs. An illustration of uh, a Paul Mazursky kissing her neck that makes it look consensual. Right. And it says, fear and desire trapped four desperate men and a strange half-animal girl. Right. So then, well, they're trying. Well, look, we'll get into that. Also makes it seem supernatural. But David, that's not the only movie we're talking about today. Yeah, it's not the only movie we're talking about you today. You sound thank, so Thank excited. God. You sound so excited. Yes. But you were, right before we start recording, reading the tagline of the second movie we're talking about today, which is a good one. The second movie is great. I love this movie, right? You like this. Yeah. This rules. Watched it this morning. It was a blast. Yeah. Her soft mouth was the road to sin-smeared violence. That's the tagline to Killer's Kiss. Her soft podcast was the road to sin-smeared violence. Uh, The mobs, moles, and mayhem of New York's clip joint jungle. That was the other tagline. That one's pretty good, too. Do you hear that off in the distance? Uh... Don't. This parade, David, can mean only one thing. I never, we've never done a parade before. Marching into towards it. us, it's the new miniseries parade. Yes, the, the uh, March Madness winner it's wearing March his Madness crown. It's March, the, the parade is marching towards us because this director we're talking about now won March Madness. Right. Uh, we don't have to sound so depressed about it. It's very exciting. Stanley Kubrick. The director is Stanley Kubrick. He's and this quite is quite well known. Blank check with Griffin and David. And this podcast is blank check. With we're Griffin not as and well David. known as Stanley Kubrick. No. My name is Griffin. My name is David. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. Sometimes those checks clear, sometimes they bounce. Baby. It's a May series. The films of Stanley Kubrick. It's called Pods Widecast. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? That's what it's called. 
And today, we're talking about his first two films. Yes. One of which he essentially disowned. Uh, yes. And the second one, which he counted as his first film, but didn't count as his first good film. But I feel like have... The Killing is the first one he stood behind and was like, this is reflective of who I want to be as a filmmaker. Yes. I think uh, he viewed these as two rough drafts and one of them he kind of disqualified. And on Killer's Kiss was also messed with, so maybe he resented that, which didn't we didn't like get into. Ending. He didn't like the ending. Right. Yes. These are his early works. And I feel like in the case of Fear and Desire, that was a movie you couldn't even see for a long time. And so it was truly forgotten. It was really the sort of like yeah. Killer's Kiss was like the first movie. Because the Fear and Desire would like went away until it was restored in like the 2010s, basically. He tried to strike it from existence. And even I think in the 90s, 80s or 90s, Film Forum got a print and they the started 90s. screening it. And he was like, please don't do this. Yes. He wrote a letter. He kind of protested. He was like, I don't want this scene. He called it a bumbling amateur film exercise. After he died, it was restored by the Library of Congress. Because the other thing was it was in public domain, which is why you can so easily see crappy color versions right. of it. Because anyone can do anything they want with it. So it wasn't really preserved. And the uh, National Library of Congress put the money in to restore it. Put it back into circulation. But we'll we'll get into all that. We'll get into all of but that. But this is our table setting introduction episode for Stanley the Manly Kubrick, who is uh, an American film director of some renown who lived for mm -hmm. seventy years and made around uh, thirteen ish movies, right? Sure. And uh, you know, he's got a couple hits to his name, and I don't know how would you describe him? A uh, looming figure. Yeah, looming. Right. Uh, I I don't know if you've experienced this, but when he won, we put him on the bracket, right? Uh, it was our 20th century bracket. Only directors from the 20th century allowed. And, and when we were sort of spitballing, eliminating people, trying to figure, uh, settle on the final 32. Yeah. Uh, Marie Barty, the great Marie Barty. Our said, social media manager, yes. Are you sure you want to put Stanley Kubrick on there? He if you put him wins. on there, he'll probably win. And we went, fine, the worst case scenario, we do Stanley Kubrick. Right. It did feel like a little bit of a foregone conclusion, perhaps. A little bit. We were I hoping was sort there'd of be an surprised. upset. Yeah. But it was one of those things where you're like, so we talk about one of the most interesting filmographies ever. And I don't know if you've had this experience, what I was trying to tell you, but uh, when people were asking me, friends, listeners of the show, how I felt about Kubrick winning, they were like, I mean, the downside is it's such a long series, right? I'm like, no, only 13 movies. Yeah, it's not that long. They span 40 years. He slowed down quite quickly. Quite and quickly. Then, he got you know. so selective about what he did that it's like we're covering the earliest films we've ever talked about on this podcast. Right, sure. We're going all the way to the very end of the 20th century. Yes. But it's only 13 movies, and two of them we're knocking out today. Yeah. Fear and Desire and Killer's Kiss, baby! Mm -hmm. And we're going to give you some little whatever, some, some, you know, some Stanley intro. Let me tell you a little about Stanley Kubrick. Let's stop beating around the bush. Can I ask you something before we get into this? Mm-hmm. What is your sort of relationship to Kubrick on whole? That's a good call, actually. Right? Uh, my relationship to Kubrick, because like many a film one. fan... We put him on there. We understood yeah. high likelihood we'd end up with him. But we didn't choose this one. So I want, I want to talk through it because yeah, certainly yeah. If, if you're a cinephile, he becomes a point of debate in a lot of ways. Well, but he's also just an early one that you've got to yeah. check in, right? Yeah. I don't know what everyone's first Kubrick movie is, but I do think my first Kubrick movie is the same for a lot of people, which is that when I was like seven mm -hmm. or eight, my dad showed me 2001. Yeah. I think he, we watched, it was like, I was a kid. I think we watched all the way to the end of the Hal part. And then he was kind of like, I mean, I think I may have been like, I, you know, what's going on? And he was like, yeah. well, and then there's more. We'll watch it again later. We'll watch the rest. Like, sure. You know, like, I think that was my first Kubrick. I th my I saw it in a theater. My mom took me to see it in a theater when I was maybe nine, and it was a similar thing. But I probably would have drifted away from the TV if I was watching it at home. But in the theater, I was held captive. Right, and I and I think my dad knew like at least the Hal part would you know what you know. This is common for a lot of young yeah. cineasts, I think. And then like I saw Doctor Strange Love at a young age. Uh huh. And I probably saw Spartacus at a fairly young age, but I don't think I had the I got to, you know, dig into Stanley Kubrick moment until no. I was a later teenager or something. I, you know, when I guess when then, when you're a later teenager, again, I'm generalizing, but I do think this is general. 
you're sort of like, well, I should see a Clockwork Orange, like, right? And like, you know, and I should see The Shining. He like, becomes you know. an activation point for a lot of people where I think they see one of his movies and they go, holy shit, who the fuck is this? I got to see everything else this guy did. And then I think for other people like you and I, it's almost just like out of, I, I hate to call it obligation, but a sense of like, if I'm getting it's serious about movies. It's one of the movies, first ones you do. You got to right. do them. And it's also the thing that like, he has this template that I think a lot of blank check directors follow where it's like, we're transitioning out of the studio system where directors are just thrown onto pictures and you make three a year or whatever it is where it's like very deliberate and the guy is like, I'm ready to make my war film. Here is my horror film. Here is my sci-fi film. Like wanting to like take a, a swing at each genre, you know? Yes. I made a satirical comedy. Here is my historical epic. Certainly. I also just feel like everyone's got, I mean, when I saw Eyes Wide Shut, I must I must have already seen most of the Kubricks, and I think like that was just that's that's my favorite Kubrick, and it's the one that like kind of made me go back yeah. and take him like you know a movie at a time when I was in college or you know and be like okay okay I need to understand everything about how this guy made movies. That's my favorite too. I've always admired him Linden. a lot more than I love his movies. I love Lyndon Shining and Eyes Wide Shut so much and I've seen them all so many times. I've never seen Lyndon. I'm really excited to watch it for this. You've never seen Barry Lyndon? Blow in your fucking mind. Yeah. Did I know that? Maybe. Maybe you've seen. I've watched up. like parts of it on TV, but I've never, I've never actually watched Lyndon. That's the best one, I think. Okay. And I've never uh, seen Spartacus either. Sure. Spartacus and I feel fun. like I've seen all the other major ones. Well, what do you mean by major one? Well, Shining, Full Metal Jacket, Clockwork Orange, 2001. Right. I've seen Paths of Glory. You've seen Lolita? I've seen Lolita. So you're naming all those movies. Right. So I, these first three I hadn't seen before. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Right. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen I Women, haven't seen, seen Spartacus. Except I had never seen Fear and Desire. I bought the Blu-ray and I watched it yeah. for this episode. Killer's Kiss I saw at the Film Forum several years ago and mm -hmm. had a great time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no. Uh, Kubrick, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean about passion for him but like i do know every inch of some of his movies and they are so worth they're so worthy of obsessive uh rewatching well that's the other thing with him it, he was the first but uh, not the first but he was one of the first directors who got mythologized in this way mm. and i think it was partially by uh critics in the community and partially by himself you know being this sort of elusive figure yeah and kind of unknowable I was reading Roger Ebert's review of Killing, or maybe it was when he did his like sort of updated great capsule for great movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was sort of talking about the temptation to find the links in the killing to the rest of his body of work. Mm. But he was like, isn't the whole appeal of Kubrick that unlike other filmmakers, he wasn't just making the same movie over and over again? Like part of what's fascinating about Kubrick is that how could this one guy make all these different right. films? Right. And there's a technical style that follows through all of it. Especially, but he's a little inscrutable in his yeah. worldview. Right. As opposed to like, we're cut off a of Fosse where it's like, you know everything about how Bob Fosse's mind works. Such an incredibly personal filmmaker. Whereas Kubrick is more like, I'm not going to tell you what this movie is about. I'm not going to talk right. about it in that way. And people who think Kubrick with it. is overrated tend to go to that argument of like, he was cold, he was dispassionate, sure, he was technical, right, but sure. there's nothing personal in there. I don't think that's ever been my stumbling block with him. Okay. I just always like his movies and respect them, but I don't feel fanatical about them or him. But there's also, it's just the thing of, right, he created, he pushed things technologically, he advanced the language. Ben, what do you think of Stan, the man? You a Stan boy? People you a Stan, are always Stan? so intense about him. That's the other sure. thing. That, I was, and I just was kind of contrarian in the sense, similar to Griffin, I... I liked A Clockwork Orange mm -hmm. quite a bit, still do. Not I mean, it's a little, though, complicated these days. Uh -huh. and Complicated in those days, too, by the way. A film that is forever complicated. Indeed. David wouldn't know this, but it was uh, banned in the UK for decades. Talk about it later. Like, fully banned. Wow. Illegal to watch. And The Shining, I mean, is a gosh darn classic. Mm -hmm. But people were so fanatical and intense and it just felt like if you did any kind of deep dive and then wanted to talk to somebody like that about those things, they would yeah. always know so much more and get really like, you know, just like, it just I was avoiding that kind of interaction, basically. I also think this isn't his fault, but 
a lot of the worst people in film think that they're Stanley Kubrick. Both the most insufferable and the like, sort of cold assholes. Like, it's either him or Hitchcock is like the yes. most sort of like legendary director of all time, I guess. Or, you know, I mean, that's that's a very broad brush. But, you know, or what, yeah, I, yes. you know, the most yes. spoken of director, the most sure. well-known director. What I, you know, so it's like, it's impossible, you know, there's too much baggage that comes with that. And they the both had that thing bang. of like exacting control. It was perfect in their head and they manipulated the universe to their whims to get it done exactly how they wanted. And they were right. Um, yeah. Stand the man. But What's Hitchcock, your... it, more films and, yeah, you know, Hitchcock at least has a sense of humor. God bless Hitchcock. Yeah. Who made a ton more movies, but yeah. he made the same kind of movies. That's what he, he made over and over, yeah. over and right. over. He had his right. personal Rare obsessions that are right there. Yes. yes. And very easy to access. Right. Kubrick, it's much more remote. And he, and he was reclusive. He wouldn't do interviews. He would. It's Kubrick. Yeah. Kubrick, I'm saying. Hitchcock could do a fucking no, interview like horse and hound. His TV whatever. Show. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. It's, it's me, it's, Alfred Hitchcock. It's the Hello. thing. People don't. People want to make Hitchcocky in movies, but I don't think they want to be Hitchcock in the same way that they want to be Kubrick. What do I like think? The personality, of Kubrick. the like tortured genius, and, and the, the control so of the public perception. Yes, sure. I mean that's another thing I'll say. You just like saying like the lack of humor, uh-huh. like the seriousness of it all too, and like almost to a point of not like not even being self aware. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then and then he makes a movie that's like one of the most well regarded comedies ever right. and at the beginning of his career. And he was by all accounts a very big fan of comedy. Like he sure. fucking always wants to do a movie with Steve Martin. Yeah, he loved Albert is, Brooks. He gets like, all mythologized with this too, where people are right. They like every passing comment he ever made becomes like totemic. Like, oh, he loved all that jazz and modern romance. Right. These are things we just cite. Like you know, Kubrick loved it, you know, like, and like, but it's because, he because would, he's unknown. Like, he was know. unknowable, right? So it's like the few things we know are the things he said to other artists, right? Uh, like, we find yes. out these things in interviews because those people say he actually called me up once and told me this. He was never making these statements publicly. He wasn't doing director's commentaries. He wasn't going on the Tonight Show. He wasn't doing much press, you know. Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Was born on July 26th. Birthday's coming up, Stan. Hey. 1928. Brooklyn. No, where was he born? He was born in Manhattan, just like you and me. Oh. To parents Jack and Gertrude Kubrick, who resided in the Bronx. Okay. He's from the Bronx. Why do you think he was from Brooklyn? I'm know. wrong. I'm very wrong. Well, I, I don't know, but uh, he's from the Bronx, mm-hmm. and he was an intelligent boy, mm-hmm. but he wasn't good at school. He didn't fit into the American education system. Poor attendance. Uh, poor grades. And so he was sent to Pasadena for a year as a child. Okay. They were hoping maybe that had sorted him out. Didn't work. By 1941, he was back in the Bronx. Wasn't doing well. Eventually ends up at Taft High School in mm-hmm. the Bronx. with a 60, Graduates with a 67 average, which I guess is bad. That sounds bad. Yeah, out of 100, like I'm a, assuming. I think that's a D. Right, right, right. I used to have the attitude when like, I got a poor grade. I was like, anything that's passing, I'm happy with. We were like, Ooh, right, but God. isn't like, I mean, again, I didn't, I did not. 60 out of 100, that's a bad, a bad result. And I'm like, I got above 65. I don't know what to tell you. Straight C's, baby. I'm yeah. killing it. Yeah. Well, Stanley like would C-. agree minus. with I'm you. I'm like, good, made it. <laughs> but he, no college. Indiana in- Jones slipped out of the boulder just in time. Grab my hat. You know, I no don't fucking care. No college in the United States would consider his application. So I guess that's the problem he runs into with sure. his 67 uh, average. But he his does His father meet- was a doctor? Yes, his father was a doctor. So he's sort of, uh, he, he is sort of wealthy within his immediate social circle. I, I, you know, he's not, he's not I don't know. He's like a but... middle class kid in the Bronx, a Jewish guy. Uh, but, I, you know, I think they, 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 were, they were doing fine for, uh-huh. for the Bronx. Yes, or for the West Bronx. Yeah, sure. In the West, you know, yeah, totally. And yeah, he, yeah, it's a D plus grade average. There you go. Okay. Confirmed. Not great. Not enough, though. I think part of the problem he had college-wise also is it's 1945. People are coming back from the war. There's a lot of demand. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? Like sure. they're, so, so like that makes it even harder. He did meet Alexander Singer in college, who's one of his early collaborators. I mean, sorry, in high school. Mm-hmm. One of his early collaborators. Uh, and he did get into photography on the school's newspaper, mm-hmm. which, of course, is Stanley Kubrick's early uh, profession. His beat. Taking pics. Click, click, shutterbug. But not moving pics. No, still. Still pics. 
And so he had a dark room at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very sophisticated about that. There weren't a lot of, you know, people doing that kind of stuff at that age. Okay, listen. I'm listening. Singer says, richest kid I knew. So there Thank you go. Thank you. I read the dossier. Right, right, right. You know? They had their own house. But, I mean, the way Singer is putting it is like, look, we all live fairly rough. That's like, what I said. I his said stable wealthy life. within right. that social circle. I, th- I think he had a, a slightly more stable sort of home setup. And look, yeah, his dad was supportive of the... He got in the dark room. His dad's yeah. like, if you want to take pictures, at least, you know, he's not like sending Stanley to military had school, I guess, spare. right? Right. Uh, gets him a Graflex. It's a kind of camera, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Alexander Singer wants to be a film director. Right. Singer's the one who kind of turns him on to the idea of film, right? And I think more than anything, what's appealing to him is how confident singer is in knowing what he wants to do and how to do it yes he like he's a, a kid looking for a fucking purpose you know singer's idea is to make a movie of the iliad mm-hmm. homer's epic poem easy yeah exactly oh, seems yeah. easy in the bronx in 1945 or whatever so he, he draws sketches right. of how to do this kubrick is supportive uh kubrick starts going to night classes but before he even really gets into that he gets an apprentice photographer job at look magazine now can we say a great name look reading through this dossier seeing the name look magazine over and over again every single time i saw it i went "Ah, cool and he works there from the age of 17 to 21 Mm -hmm. big break and learns all about photography it's you know he learns on the job right you know he's Yeah. yeah he's he's learning at the hands of skilled people I talked about, I think, in one of the Demi episodes that I feel like most filmmakers, and getting back to what we were talking about, are either like architects or anthropologists, right? Mm -hmm. There's either a thing they want to construct or there's a thing that exists that they want to capture. And it is a thing that's interesting about Kubrick, and it's interesting when you start with these early films as we are, that it's like he goes from being a photojournalist to a documentary short subject filmmaker. Uh Uh-huh. To making these short, uh, his first couple films feel a lot more documentary esque. Yes. And as time goes on, it becomes more and more precise. Like he does go from being a person who's trying to capture things out in the wild to a person who's trying to create his own reality. Mm, right. Photography seems fun. Yeah, photography rules. He shot Montgomery Cliff with a camera. Yeah, not with a gun. Uh, Don't that's, that's a cool thing he did. Yeah. Have you guys ever worked in a dark room? Yeah. Worked with like film cameras? Yeah. I, w- I was I I was a big photography kid. Same. Yeah. I got really into it. It's it's such a fun thing, but it, it in these days it no. just feels like it's almost it's expensive. You got to put it in the magic juice, yeah. and then you move it around with tongs, and then the picture appears, and then you put it on a little clothesline. It line. rolls. It's so fucking cool. And it then it really drip, cool. drip 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 dry. And if you open the door and the light comes in. You're gonna ruin them. It was one of those right? things where I was like, "That was Did like, I nail it? yeah, okay. yeah." That was like one of the better hobbies I it does seem had nice. that yeah. I really enjoyed, and I enjoyed the whole process of it, and I enjoyed the dark room and everything. And it was just like in the years of my adolescence, my teen years, I saw it become harder and harder to buy film, yeah. to find places that gave you access to a dark room. You know, I was like taking classes, and then they were like disappearing in real time. And just getting really expensive. Yeah. Like the paper, everything was just becoming uh, less and less available. Yeah. And I, I had like a like a like uh, uh, an old Russian Krasnogorsky 8mm film camera. And I made like short films on it. And then it was just like, oh, there's one place you can get this developed. There's one place that will transfer this for you. Right. You know, and it's like a window and it costs a billion dollars. <laughs> Like all these things just became so fucking difficult to to do, but there is it's it's a great process. It's in a great excuse to break into abandoned buildings and take pictures of decay. I mean, well, that's that was a point. big subject of mine. Decay, decay. I like the idea of you dressing like Jimmy Olsen with like an old school camera and a flash bulb as a cover for people who would yell at you for loitering. Or trespassing and be like, uh, uh, no, gee, Williker, sir, I'm, I'm just a photojournalist. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I was board. never that smart. While working at Look, uh-huh. Kubrick marries his first wife, Toba Metz, Taft graduate, who I think he was married to for just a couple years. They get and divorced. I in think Singer had a quote where he was like, they weren't really married. It was just like a relationship. They were just dating. They were in their teens. They got married essentially right to avoid whatever like impropriety yeah yeah yeah, right so they could uh, hold hands in public without getting arrested 
His second wife is Ruth Sabatka, a uh-huh. dancer. Who's in Killer's Kiss. Who is in Killer's Kiss. Mm-hmm. Uh, and eventually, uh, yeah, when he when she meets him, he's still married. But they get divorced in 51. Mm-hmm. And Ruth marries Stanley Kubrick in 52. Isn't that crazy to think about that era in time where if you wanted to ask someone out on a date, you essentially had to ask them to marry you and go like, I'll give this a shot. Yes. I, it is really crazy. It is weird. Right? It's also crazy from then the other side of it, right? Where it's just like, thinking as like a woman in those times Mm -hmm. truly had like no rights. No, absolutely. And uh, very often it wouldn't be like Kubrick and his first wife. They just stay married forever. Even if six months later, they realize they didn't like each other. Um, Well, what Stan liked to do. Divorce women. No. Well, he did that twice, but Mm no. Go to the movies. Ah. He would see every single movie, every single movie. We used to go to terrible Double features. This is David Vaughn, who shoots, uh, who's the director of photography on Killer's Kiss, I think, or maybe not. Oh, uh-huh. He's an early guy. Uh, but, um, you know, they go see double features just on 42nd Street. He was only interested in the way films were made visually. If actors started to talk too much, he would read his paper by whatever light he could find until they stopped talking. Very <laughs> annoying uh, audience members. Incredibly annoying. <laughs> just just rustling the paper. <laughs> He was very critical of films. He mm-hmm. was obsessed with them. He wanted to see everything. You go to the important movies, too. You go to Museum of Modern Art to see Diary of a Country Priest, an early sure. favorite of Steven Spielberg. I mean, Stephen Stanley Kubrick's. Maybe Steven Spielberg's. This as well. is another Kubrick mythology thing, though, is that he like sort of willed himself into being a film genius. Mm-hmm. Right? He didn't work up the ranks on shoots. He obviously didn't go to film school because that was not really a thing. But it's like he just saw a billion movies, then made his first film, Fear and Desire, which was essentially making a film as film school, like teach myself to do this by doing it. Right. And then he was a filmmaker. You know, Uh, like, I mean, Nolan sort of has a similar trajectory. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, part of what it's they, they keep saying is that he would keep seeing these movies and be like, I know why this is bad. And this is what I would have done differently. Right. Like, he's very obsessed with sort of like, I can see how this could have been made better with right. these run-of-the-mill Hollywood movies. Um, so, that was his whole thing was he was like, I don't know if I can make a great movie, but I know I can make a movie better than 40% of what I'm seeing. David? Yep. These are pretty sweaty movies. Uh, yeah, that's true. Fear and Desire is kind of tropical or whatever. It's got some sweat. Yeah, but there's, there's some flops. People are panicked, too. These are movies of people under pressure in difficult true. situations. Which I'll tell you a difficult situation I found myself in recently that produces a lot of sweat. What? Sleeping. Yeah, it's true. It can be quite warm. You want to be cool. I don't know if you know this, David, but this goddamn global warming has made sleeping no day at the beach. Or it is like a day at the beach because it feels like you're fucking lying out in the sun. Right. I don't call it global warming. I call it hot girl summer. Eternal hot girl yes. summer. Yes, absolutely. A positive spin on it. But we're all sweating the bed is the point these days. That's true. But Brooklyn is here to keep you cool and living in comfort at home and on the go with their best-selling bedding, loungewear, towels, and more. Yes, yes, yes. This stuff is breathable, folks. They help make your entire bed feel like the cool side of the pillow. The important thing is you can replace your heavy winter bedding with their lightweight comforters for the ultimate breezy, light as a cloud feel because... They're uh, crafted with smooth, long staple cotton. You're drifting off to sleep in no time while staying chill through the night. You know what I love doing, David? I, I love ordering products from Brooklyn and, and trying out things in different colors so I can have different combinations that Brooklyn and I already have. Right. And maybe this makes me sound like a simp okay. and a bootlicker for Brooklyn, in, but, but then, then that's what I am. I accept the title because I love them. I love Rich and Vicky Fulop, mm-hmm. and I love their products. And right now I'm looking over at my bed and I'm rocking like a dandelion yellow and like a dark green. I think it was called Mojito. Ooh, you're a fiend for it. I know, because I used to do green and pink together. Nice. And now it's like I got yellow and green. And then my next rotation, next wash will be pink and purple. You see what I'm doing there? I mean, I like it. I like it. I don't know what to tell you. I like it. I like it. I like Brooklyn. And I like, I like, I like sleeping. In Brooklyn, it makes one of my favorite activities, if not my favorite activity, even better, and it keeps me cool. Okay, well, head over to Brooklyn Inn today to keep your cool at home and on the go all summer long. Go to brooklynin.com and use promo code blank to get $20 off your purchase 
of $100 or more and free shipping. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and enter promo code blank for $20 off and free shipping. The first two movies, he essentially gets financed by parents, friends, and relatives who run pharmacies. It's funny. On both of these films, you read that all the money came from, like, fucking pharmacies and drugstores. It's like those were the sort of most cash liquid people he knew. And he just sort of gave them the pitch on the investment. He was able to teach himself a lot of photography, right? So it's like he understood that language, that workflow. But by all accounts, these first two movies, and especially Fear and Desire, were like, I'm going to learn how to do everything right by doing everything wrong first. Well, before we do talk about that. Yeah. He's, just answering his question. He's obsessed with Sergei Eisenstein and Vesvolod Pudovkin, the second Pudovkin especially, who wrote a book called The Film Technique. Mm -hmm. He read that obsessively. Uh, he also played a lot of chess, uh, and he won with enough frequency that he actually made money. Uh, and he saw chess as a great analogy for filmmaking because you have to balance resources against the problem, right? You yeah. know, you're, you have to you know, think ahead calmly. You have to be like, is this the best idea? Are there better ideas? This is this whole thing with chess. In a lot of ways, I think that's the thing that gives him a weird advantage, that he's able to shift it into that mindset, because I do think a lot of the sort of self-taught, self-proclaimed film geniuses who just watch a billion movies and then go like, I could make a thing better than this, know how to theoretically make a great film in their mind. But the thing they struggle with is when they get to the stage where it's like, now you are interfacing with other real people in right. real time, working yeah. against a clock with a set amount of money. And then a lot of those people crumble. You know, they don't know how to win over people. They don't know how to communicate their vision to other people. I do think the sort of strategic thinking of the chess thing helps him. Um, his first film is a 1951 documentary short entitled Day of the Fight. Alex Perry asked me if we're doing that one on the podcast. I said, no! Uh-huh. Um, but you can watch all these on YouTube, and one of them is on the Fear and Desire. Disc. Yeah, I think Day of the Fight is. I can't uh, remember. The, is it? What is, is, there, is it? The Wayfarers. Is that what it's called? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Seafarers? Uh, the Seafarers. Yeah. Yes, and there's also Flying Padre. I right. Think I think the, the British release of Fear and Desire has Flying Padre mm -hmm. and what's it called? The Big Fight? Uh, the first thing he did was called The Day of the Fight. The Day of the Fight, sorry. And it was based on a photo feature he'd shot for Look. Mm -hmm. And it's about a middleweight boxer at the height of his career named Walter Cartier. Uh, it seems like a bit of, you know, an inspiration for Killer's Kiss, right? I watched this. It's really good. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, you know, basically is kind of like, well, I can, you know, give it a shot, right? I can but give, also, like, you know, moving cameras a shot. Like, look, you know, he came from this. a relative amount of money. Right. Right. And at, beyond that, even, he had resources. He had direct ties to people who had money. Sure. And, like, you read about even a Day of the Fight, and it was, like, a business proposition where he was just like, there's a market for short films or for documentary shorts and newsreel shorts, sort of adjacent things that will yes. play before theaters. I can raise $3,900 yes. to just self-produce this. And then he sold it for $4,000. Right. Because what he was inspired by was Alexander Singer had worked on an, another short, The March of Time, which apparently it's like they'd spent $40,000 making. And Kubrick was like, I can make something for a tenth right. of that or whatever. You know, and I think part of that was just that he knew that he understood the technical aspects of the camera, lighting, all of this so well that he was like, I'll save money by doing it all my fucking self. Um, so he does. And he does, as you say, make a tidy $100 profit. Uh-huh. Uh, he was told that was the most RKO Pathé had ever paid for a short, so they must have liked it. Mm -hmm. And he had lots of experience uh, making this. He was a cameraman. He was the editor. He was the sound effects guy. He did it all himself. He gets a grasp of the technical aspect of filmmaking. And so RKO, happy with what he made, mm -hmm. gives him $1,500 advance to make Flying Padre, which is about a priest uh, who is, I guess, flying from settlement to settlement in New yes. Mexico. Giving supplies, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's only nine minutes long. Uh -huh. Was Big fights a... like 12, yes. 13, something like that. Yeah. They're, all, they're all short, right? Seafarer is like, half, is like an half an hour long. Yeah. Right. And um, that was sort of more a, a for hired job. He barely breaks even on a flying padre, but it, I guess he's inspired enough to quit look. Mm -hmm. And he wants to make his feature film debut. Uh, and he's sort of trying to figure that out. Uh, he raises... 10 grand mm -hmm. 
from friends and his father and his uncle who he lived with in Pasadena that one time. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess he has these movies that people have seen. So sure. he can at least point to that They've when he's released. raising money. Right. Right. And he signs a one picture deal with uh, this guy, Martin Perlever. That's his uncle, with his right. uncle. Who, who owned a drugstore, right? Right. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, he's the one with the most money. But, but he said, like, I think you're going to be a big director. I'm not giving you money for one movie. Uh, you're signing a deal with me where I get a percentage of the rest of your career. It was essentially the deal we talked about in the Fosse. JJ drew this connection. Yes, that's right. But the guy who sort of discovered him as a dancer. It was like, I get 15% of everything. Right. It's the Rick Mackey, King Richard deal. And Kubrick, stubborn fuck that he was, was like, I'm not fucking signing away with my career. You get one movie or nothing. He's fucking savvy. I know. I'm, I'm getting, I'm like impressed. And his uncle was like, then, then no money. Sorry. I'm not interested in one film. And like he fucking caves like a month later. is like, God damn it. I'll fucking give you the money for the one movie. Right. Like this guy just, it's the chess thing. He knew how to like get in people's heads and outplay them very quietly, you know? Howard Sackler, uh -huh. who eventually is going to be a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, writes The Great White Hope in the 60s, right. is a high school friend of his or whatever, and he had written this little uh, screenplay called The Trap, and this is Fear and Desire. This is what sure. they make. They, are, they were going to shoot it in New York, but it was too cold, mm -hmm. so they go to California, the San Gabriel Mountains outside Los Angeles. Kubrick's the camera operator and the director. They had three Mexican laborers who carried the equipment. That's the only crew, essentially, that It was there less is. than 15 people, including the full cast. Right. Um, worked on the movie in totality, at least in terms of shooting. Because you've also got Kubrick's wife, actors, a couple other friends, apparently, doing sure. some sort of like, yes. Uh, he shot it on a 35-millimeter Mitchell camera, rented it for $25 a day. Shot it without sound, though. Which yes. Which was... The prevalent technique, especially for documentary filmmaking, where you would just dub it in later. Do it later. Because it's too hard to mic up. It's fucking sound technology Hold a equipment. boom. You seen these guys? He Holy hated booms, the way the boom jumps? Inter inter interfered with his lighting setups. Like He, he was just like, I'll do this later. And, uh, and, and so he wanted, he wanted the thing to be silent. He wasn't even going to dub it over. He wanted to be silent. And then they watched it, and he was like, God damn it. I fucking got to go in and add all the sound. And... Re-record all the dialogue, and then it, like, tripled his budget. It was a huge mistake on his part, he yeah. said, because the food shooting the movie thought cost $9,000, and all the post stuff cost 30000 So that's not great. Um, but he didn't know what he was doing, but he's learning. He'd never used a movie camera like this before. Uh, the, the Mitchell that he's using, he's learning that, too. He's learning how to, like, load film, 35-millimeter film and all that. D Dave and I were texting about this while I was watching the film. But, uh, yeah, covered a lot of first films on this podcast. And sometimes you see one where you're like, holy fucking shit, how is this, this person's first film? Right? And usually the answer is, they, there, was, there was some gradual process working up to that. Right? Nora Ephron establishes herself as a writer and then as a screenwriter. And by the time she's directing her own film, she's been on sets a lot. She's dealt with studio politicking, what have you, mm, you know? Mm, the Wachowskis mm. were doing like for higher screenwriting work, spec scripts, whatever. Like all these people have these things the hardest thing to do is i think to not even step foot onto a production for the first time as a director when you've never done that before but to like make your own production so he's not even stepping into like an established studio system thing he's bringing a bunch of friends out to the fucking woods of california with equipment he rented and assuming he knows what he's doing and like christopher nolan's first movie following is like this where it was like shot over four years, renting out the the footage whenever there was a free the the equipment whenever there was a free weekend, doing it with his friends, whatever. And when you watch a movie like that, it's like, oh, it's it's really impressive when you consider you're watching this guy figuring it out in real time. This movie is interesting because he doesn't really. He doesn't figure it out. No, I mean yeah. this is not a good movie. The Killer's Kiss. You throw this on, you're like. Beginning, middle, and end. Right. Thrilling sequences. Yeah. Some really interesting photography. This yeah. is a movie. Some interesting themes. I went to see it in the theater, yeah. and I was like, even though it's short, and I was like, I was like, I had a good time in the yeah. theater. If I saw Fear and Desire, I'd be like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, not knowing that it's Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, there's a couple of ideas here, but like, I would basically think, like, is this a student film? Right. We'll we'll talk about that. The cast: Frank Silvera, who's also in Killer's Kiss, is the only like real actor here. And he's good. 
He's got more pizzazz. He's good. I think Mazursky's kind of good. You think Mazursky's kind of good because he's Paul Mazursky. I don't think he's like amazing, but it is interesting to see him. He was working for me before I put together it was Paul Mazursky. So the guy who's the creep in Fear and Desire, with the, that's a guy who becomes a very good filmmaker. Did Harry Later Tonto, which we were disparaging in a recent episode, but Bob, hey, Bob Carol and Ted Carol. and Alice. Yeah, unmarried, unmarried woman. Unmarried you know, woman. Yeah, sort it's of some a, great films. Comedy drama legend of the 60s. And 70s. He's an early yeah, yeah. dramedy, 70s. Yeah. yeah. Um, Actors, director. Virginia Life, Leaf. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how you say her last name, but you know, she's in some movies. What's, the, what's it called? The Man with the Screaming Brain. What's that movie the called? The Brain That Wouldn't Die. Man with the Screaming Brain is a Bruce Campbell oh, thing. Very good name. I know. I mean, I right? like that. Bruce Campbell, did, it's like a 2000s. He did his sort of homage to Corman movies. I think it's called The Man with the Screaming Brain. Uh, the way Mazursky puts Kubrick is here he is, right? He's doing it all. He's doing the lighting. He's doing the camera work. Yeah. He's doing the editing. He doesn't know how to talk to actors. Like right. there's not a lot of guidance from him on right. that front. Which he's he's not worked with actors at all right. at this point. He's just had to step back and observe people doing their thing. Uh, Frank Silvera at one point uh, has a story. They had run out of money, I guess. Mm-hmm. And Frank Silvera was like, "Well, I'm getting my money no matter what. I'll tell you that right now." And he. Uh, got his money. Uh, I guess. I guess he was worried that I guess they would have no movie and he would not get paid. But mm-hmm. they do figure it out. But it does just feel like a lot of the stories are like the thing he had not yet figured out at all is how to direct actors or anything like that. And then there's the other thing you said about the dubbing and all that. Like it, it's a lot of a lot of mistakes are being made. It's partly why he disowns this movie. Probably I know, but you yeah. know, for me, like that. That's not even my issue with this film. It's I don't think they had a clear enough story. Yeah, there's not really a story. Right. That that's the thing. Because I'm like I love watching fucking rough primordial first films from directors, you such know? as like here. What's a good version of this? Right. Like well, I I I, think I agree. Fo- with you. I think following is a good version of this. Yes. In that it, it's, it's reasonably entertaining. You see the pieces. Following is a better movie. It's yeah. not... It's not a great film. Great, right. But no, at least but it's, it's like, something. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of like these early films where the, the, the filmmaker's process is so apparent, you know? Yeah. I mean, a movie that I think is great is, uh, which I saw for the first time recently, A uh, Story of a Three-Day Pass, the Melvin Van Peebles movie, which was I'm similarly not. a first film that he kind of scraped together yeah. outside of the system. That movie's got like such incredible feeling in it. Um, I mean, the, the fucking original version of Shadows is unwatchable. It's tough to watch. I've watched that. No, no. I mean, it literally, it's the one he won't let anyone see. And oh, oh general, you mean the, oh, I've never seen. No, but but, but I think the version of Shadows that exists is like that. Is yeah. similarly like there's interesting stuff in here. It's very it's much a first film. A movie, yeah. right? And then Faces is like a first proper film. I remember I watched Shadows because it was. Was it restored and there was like a New Yorker article maybe about the restoration? Yeah. Of like, oh, this lost, like, you know. And like, I remember I watched it as a teenager and walked away just being like, I don't know what. Like, I might as well have just read the magazine article. Forget, I don't know what I'm, I'm supposed to take what the away guy's name is. I think it's maybe M.T. Carney, who's like the leading Cassavetes historian, uh, uncovered the first version of which, Shadows, uh-huh. which Cassavetes hated so much, he like put it in a box and said, like, no one will ever see this and reshot the movie entirely with different actors. And then he got a copy and was, Ray Carney, perhaps? Yes, thank you. Yes. Was going to um, restore it and release it and Jenna Rollins and I'm forgetting the guy's name, he was Cassavetes' producer, blocked it from happening. But like, I wonder if that movie looks like this. Uh, they get um, the music done by Gerald Freed, uh-huh. who is like some oboe major at Juilliard mm-hmm. that Alex Singer knows. He's like the only musician he knows. It's a lot of shit like that, right? You know, just sort of bringing in people. He says the music was supposed to mourn the world's innocence. Okay. Did you get that from the music? Sure. Okay, cool. The movie is then retitled Shape of Fear. And Kubrick is looking for a distributor. I mean, especially in the 50s, this is an insane way to make a movie. This isn't how you do it. No, not at all. You don't make a full-ish, you know, like a 60-minute movie no. with no real plot about, like, soldiers in a war who are like who meet a woman and then try and find a distributor. I mean, like, that's... No. Yeah. no this movie also feels like it's, like, adapted from a poem. Like, it doesn't even yes. feel like it's a short story adapted to an hour. It feels like it's... They had an idea of a feeling and a theme and it is not really dramatized. And there'll be moments that are kind of gripping. But it's like he's basically got the thing of like, in, in war, men go crazy. They become so overtaken by their primal fear right. and desire, right? Like that's his whole fucking thing. And then you're just sort of like, at minute 10, you're like, I get it. 
Yeah. Because I at times I'm like, is this kind of referencing the Spanish American War? Um, the Spanish American War or the Spanish Civil War? The Spanish American War. I don't which know. Which took place on an island, right? Um, well, I mean, obviously it's it's coming out during this the Korean War. No, I know, but and I'm maybe there's some referencing an a, a past I mean, Spanish American conflict. The, the opening narration I found so interesting because it felt Cuban, like Cuban, Puerto Rico, it's abstracting so, right, the war and being like the enemy doesn't matter where they are doesn't matter they're in the primal state of war and then the movie doesn't feel like it's really doing that and I wonder if the narration is just him being like I don't want to have to fucking pick yeah. like it almost feels like a Top Gun Maverick thing of just like just let me tell a story about war without like right without it being a specific being war. anything I don't know yeah he eventually gets an indie film distributor called Joseph Burston who released foreign films like uh-huh. Rome Open City or Bicycle Thieves. Sure. He sees it. Good movies, by the way. Those are good movies. Yeah. He sees Fear and Desire and says he's a genius. This is an American art picture without any artiness. I don't know what that means. I don't either. I guess it's also hard to identify at this point because it's stuff that we just take as a given. But there must be shit that if you're watching this movie in the early 1950s, you're like, Fuck, I haven't seen that technique this before. This is poetic. There's no scene enemy. Like, right. what does it mean? Uh, so it gets our head distribution. It gets the a newness of, of it is gripping enough to overwhelm the fact that there's not a lot going on, you know? It makes no money. But when but, Kubrick later gets money, he pays back his investor. Nice. Yes. Kind. Um, but, and he, well, and the, kind, he better. <laughs> Thoughtful. Hey, fucking Earl's gonna... Yeah, I guess low bar, but you hear so often about people not doing that. Kubrick is embarrassed by this movie. Yeah, it doesn't like it. This sounds it. It's not a film I remember with any pride, he says. Uh, the ideas we put across were good, but we had no experience to embody them dramatically. It was really just a 35 millimeter version of what a class of film students would do in 16 millimeters. Yeah, and you, and you feel like if he was in film school, he would have made a 15 minute version of this and got it out of his system rather than having to put on it, this needs to be a commercial enterprise. Yes. I'm raising money. I have to make it back by distributing it. It's the uh, challenging thing of this medium. That we, we all love yeah. and we've been talking about on this podcast for how many freaking years? Ugh. You need a, a lot of people and a lot yeah. of equipment and a lot of planning. It's not yeah. like something that you can just, oh, I want to try this out. No, and it's, it's why film school is popular because it's like, you know, art school for other concentrations is teaching you technique, form, all of that. Film school is also giving you the structure of like, the school is operating like a studio. The crew is going to be your classmates. You know, there's common equipment you're all renting and sharing. Like, it, it's, it's hard to do it outside of that. And, and the people who get there without going through film school, as I said, tend to take circuitous paths and work their way up to the position of director, having first done other things surrounding a film production. In 1999, Mazursky remembered that at one point, John Borman was going to introduce this print of Fear and Desire that had been rediscovered Mm -hmm. at like Telluride or something. Sure. And Stanley called him up and was like, please don't. I hate that movie. Don't don't do that. (laughs) So Ed Borman was like, okay. It's like me when people try to share pictures of the two years where I had long hair. Oh, wow. Sure. Bad. Or when they try and screen butt whistle at Telluride or whatever. Well, no, that's probably the best movie I've ever been (laughs) in. Fair enough. Um, I want to see this long hair pic. I bad, think I've seen bad. a couple long hair at Griff's. Bad. They, they're it's not your best look. It was okay, not. This one look, was like 13. I'll, yeah. I want to look like Tom Cruise. It's a little Impossible stringy, too. is from what I remember of like a Facebook photo I saw mm, or whatever. It's a little more carrot toppy, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> sure. Well, that sounds great. I kept on being like, when is it going to flip back like Tom Cruise? And no one explained to me, you have curly hair. <laughs> Maybe someone could have sat you down. I did, like, my parents made it, several mistakes. Go on. That's it with Fear and Desire. Do we want to talk about the plot of Fear and Desire? Act yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Soldiers are walking around. Yeah. Act they're stranded. Two. Their plane went down. Their plane went down. They're trying to get back uh, across enemy lines. It's starting to feel a little bit tense. And then they find a raft. Uh-huh. So there's some raft business. Sure. And then they uh, see a girl, mm-hmm. a peasant girl who does not speak their language, I guess. She the poster talk. refers to as half animal. <laughs> yeah. Which made me also a, she wonder. She seems pretty calm. Right. But... Between the opening narration and that tagline of the poster, I was like, is Stanley going supernatural? Is there some fucking twist here? And it's like, no, they're just saying she's half animal because she doesn't speak English. Tie her up to a tree. I don't really know why. I guess for her to not reveal them their position. Y- yeah. Yeah. And then and then Mazursky kind of goes Mazursky is left alone with her and goes nuts and unbelts yeah. her and she tries to escape and he shoots her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then eventually Frank Silvera, who's the one with a little more sure. pizzazz, 
uh, goes off on his own. And so he's sort of on a raft for a while, kind of talking to himself. Right. Because when she gets tied to the tree, I was like, so is this whole is this movie the drama? Right. in it's, the woods? Is this it? Right. The presence of what a do woman we do? finally unraveling them. Or is it is it the unravel of the accidental death and the cover up or whatever? And it's like, no, that's sort of just a thing that happens. Well, also the the youngest soldier loses it. Right. And his like his like the way he's playing shell shocked or whatever, it's it's so it's so crazy. And that, like right. day one, like acting stuff. It, it's the other thing. I mean, I just find it fun, but it's the other thing that Kubrick becomes famous for this very clamped down, toned down acting style, right? Okay. It's not naturalistic because it's very stylized, but he likes sort of bottled emotions. He likes quiet. He likes stillness. He likes all these things. It's weird to watch these first couple of movies where you do have people who are still going like, you see here, yeah. you know, I, I gone batty. Like he's yes. just going to iron all of that out of his cinematic language once he realizes how to control actors. What else? Uh, well, then we're, we're, there's the weird thing where we the suddenly enemies. are cutting to these two generals just talking in a room. Which I kind of like. Well, it's, in, it's, it's cool. Looking. Interesting. It's a, yes. But you are kind of like, who's this? <laughs> like, right. You know, like just if you're, again, just trying to follow a plot here. Right. You're like, I don't really understand. But yes, they are the But enemies. it almost feels like a grand illusion thing where you like, you then cut to the office and you stay in their perspective for a while, you know? Yes. It's an interesting idea. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. Sure. But it, it partly just sort of seems motivated by like, look, we only have so many locations and actors, so yeah. we'll just cut to them. Well, once again, this thing shouldn't be an hour. I don't know who I'm saying this to. Like, it, it's Stanley! Like, right. Cut it down. Yeah. Uh, and then they kill the enemy general and escape. And then they get on the raft. Yeah, war is bad for the human psyche. That's pretty much what this movie is saying, which I agree with. I'm no more convinced by the end of it. Right. Uh, I was talking the other day about how anytime I watch a war film, I'm just like, uh, you should stop doing this. Oh, that's right. You, you're not a big war film guy. No, because I just, I go like, uh, everyone should just meet in the middle and go like, we, do you just leave? Uh, just leave. Yeah. yeah so just, they tend what to, the they fuck tend are we to doing not here? want you to do yeah. that. I mean, if, if human history has shown us anything, is that I think we're working towards eventually coming to that conclusion. Gotta leave. Very just gotta leave and just, you know, shake hands. Yeah. Sure. Okay, like, what, are we, what are we doing here? What is it good for, one might ask? Yeah. Hey. Absolutely. Good God, y'all. Uh, good God, y'all. All right, so this movie makes no money. Uh-huh. One would think Box that office might... game? Oh, yeah. I guess we might as well just do it now. Do we want to do the box office game for Fear and Desire? Absolutely. Wow, okay. you guys just got so much more excited. I know, right? That's <laughs> why I'm throwing it in here now. Thank God we, we didn't do we this. We need a pep up. We need, we need to do a bump. Thank God we didn't do this as, as just a solo episode. Yep. All right. The box office game for Fear and Desire, which came out uh, the 1st of April, 1980, 1953 or something. Fear it opened to zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, look, I'm doing my best here. Yeah. Uh, number one at the box office is a musical film directed Remind me the by year again, sorry. 1953. Okay. A uh, musical film directed by uh, Walter Lang, based uh-huh. on a stage musical. Okay. Not one I really know. Okay. Uh, starring, you know, a famous musical actress. Color picture? I think it is in color. Oh, is it? Is it Ethel Merman? It is an Ethel Merman. Okay. You nailed it. Okay. To 1953. Three. It's also got Donald O'Connor. Is it, a, is it Anything Goes? It's not Anything Goes. Okay, but Donald O'Connor and Ethel Merman did do an, uh, an Anything Goes movie. But that's not what this is. I know. This is set in Washington, D.C., uh, and it's about a socialite who hmm. is appointed ambassador to a tiny fake country. Did you know this title? Have you heard of this movie before? Uh, not, no, no, I don't think I do. It's, the songs are by Irving Berlin. Okay. George Sanders is also in this movie. I don't know it. Is it called Those Fat Cats Up on Capitol Hill? I mean, essentially. I mean, this is wild, but is it Dr. Doom? Dr. Doom? Ben? uh, Fake uh, country? Yeah. It's not the musical Dr. Doom. (laughs) As good as that would be. Yeah, that was 51 when Ethel Merman played Victor Von Doom (laughs) in a Um, musical. That was 51, Ben. That's the only uh, thing that's foolish about your guess is the wrong year. The movie is called Call Me Madam. Okay, yeah, no idea. All right. Uh, At least I guess Ethel. 
get half credit for that or something. You know, I mean, Ethel was kind of a good, uh, yeah, a good one there. Yeah. All right. So the next one is. Remember when Ethel Merman and Ernest Borgnine were married for like two hours? Uh, sure. I and mean, then they were like, we got married and we had sex, and we were like, what, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> God, it looks terrible. This is going to gross everyone out for decades. <laughs> That's later in life too. I think she. That's yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> this is awful. We all make mistakes. That's what she said about uh, her many marriages. Uh, in her autobiography, Merman, Merman, Merman. It's called Merman. It's called Merman. Okay. I just read that as cold. Read that as Merman. Yeah. In her autobiography, Merman, the chapter titled "My Marriage to Ernest Borgnine." Ernest Borgnine consists of one blank page. Funny. Pretty good burn. That's a good bit. Uh, all right. Oh. Number two at the box office. It's a biblical drama. It's based a biblical drama. On a famous biblical figure who has been dramatized many times. King of Kings? No. <sighs> it's directed by William Dieterl. Dieterl. Is it a Jesus movie? Uh, who's the guy who made, like, uh, it's not a Jesus movie. Who got, you know, he made Life of Emile Zola okay. and Story of Louis Pester, a lot of those, like, famous old biopics. So it's like the David O. Russell of his time. He's a guaranteed Oscar. No, for any of his actors. Yeah, and he was always screaming at Lily Tomlin. Um, yeah. This is a Rita Hayworth film. It's a Rita Hayworth film. Biblical figure. Is she Mary Magdalene? No. Nope. Uh, You're not going to get it. I'm not going to get it? I don't think so. What is it? Uh, it's always some of the other actors. Charles Lawton. Okay. Okay. Stuart Granger. Okay. You know him? He's in Hitchcock movies. Yeah, I'm right? just, I'm mm-hmm. going to is it Moses? Is it a Moses no, movie? No, this is Moses why you're not going to get it. It's Salome. Salome. Oh, okay. Exactly. Salome? Yeah, I don't know. Salome, is that it? I think so. Maybe. They're always doing him, her. Yeah. They're always doing her. Yeah, sure. Isn't it Pacino who's always doing yeah. Salome? Yeah, yeah, anyway. He did Salome with Jessica Chastain, and then he made a documentary about himself making Salome. This is the thing. All right, so we're Who's moving on. Salome? She's like a, a biblical princess, like from, you know, the daughter of Herod II. Like, she's, no, you know, it's, it's a whole it's, thing. Anyway, no, we're fine. not going to talk no, about I, it. I exactly. don't need to know. We're moving on to a movie we've all heard of. It's Do you an think animated... there are people yelling at us right now? <laughs> The way people not. yell at us when we're like disrespectful of certain genres. Like, Who the fuck Salome? <laughs> Probably. Uh, so yeah, we sorry, don't know about sorry, real Queen things. Salome, if I said your name wrong. Yeah. Salome, Salome. Uh, it's Salome, Salome. Maybe I'm wrong. Number three at the box Probably office is wrong. an animated film. Everything. Number three at the box From office is the Walt Disney Corporation. Animated film. In 52. Three. Fuck. In 53. Would it be. It's only been out for about a month. Sleeping Beauty? No. Is that bef- is that earlier or later? Later. It's later. Wait. Sleeping Beauty is 59. Okay, 59. So then the fi- game to 50. <sighs> is it Cinderella? It's not Cinderella. That it- is 50. Is it a princess? No. It's not. No. 52. Three. Oh my god. 53. Not a princess. No, it's a hero. It's a hero. Yes. In 53. It's not Pinocchio. It's not Bambi. No. It's not Jungle Book. It's not 101 Dalmatians. No. Those are later. Those are all later. Uh, Bambi and Pinocchio are earlier. Are early. It's not Fantasia. No. That's very early. I'm aware. I'm So why'd you bring it up? Because I'm ruling embarrassing. things out. I'm not embarrassing. I'm special. <laughs> I think this came later. Goofy movie? It's a goofy movie. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's extremely goofy. Only 50s <laughs> kids understand. <laughs> Uh, no, it is being remade for Disney Plus, I think, very soon. Oh, is it Sword in the Stone? No! Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> That's 63, baby! It's Peter Pan. It's Peter Pan. Uh, Disney's Peter Pan. Sorry. A good movie! Yeah, I like Peter Pan. Captain Hook? Yeah, best ride of all time, maybe? Okay, I don't know from your rides. You will. Someday I'll make what you, do you on have that to go to Neverland or something. And you'll be charmed, and it will cost $8,000. God. David? Yep. You've heard me talk about how important it is to have a VPN to protect your online privacy. In fact, I'm almost a broken record at this point on the issue. Endless nattering about this. It's become my catchphrase. It, it really is if people want to perfect a Griff impression. It's, uh, well, listen here. It's very important to have a VPN to protect your online privacy. That's how people mock me. That's true. They're always dragging It's my only mockable quality. (laughs) Yes. Well, I, as much as I like to make fun of you, it's important to have a VPN to protect your privacy, but equally as important is choosing a VPN you trust. Yes. We do research on our sponsors and only recommend brands 
that we believe in, and I can say with full confidence that ExpressVPN is the best VPN on the market, and here's why, Griffin. Choosing a VPN, David, is like choosing a, a life partner, a romantic partner. Trust is paramount. Number one, ExpressVPN doesn't log your activity online, right? A lot of Like any log- good romantic partner, not logging your activity online, letting you do your own shit behind the safety of a keyboard. There's, there's lots of uh, cheap or free VPNs that make money selling your data <laughs> advertisers. ExpressVPN yeah. doesn't do that. They have a technology trusted server that makes their VPN services incapable of storing any data at all. That that is just for you and that VPN and no one else. Number two, speed. ExpressVPN now uses Lightway, a new VPN protocol they engineered to make user speeds faster than ever. Uh, ExpressVPN always blazing fast, lets you stream videos in HD quality with zero buffering. I'm seeing deadline headline right now. ExpressVPN has entered the speed force. And everyone is cheering. The last thing that really sets ExpressVPN apart is how easy it is to use. You don't need any technical skills. You fire up the app. You tap one button to connect. That's it. Even your grandparents could do it. Now, I'm not sure about that. Grandparents are dead, yeah, mostly. And the other one, I have to go to her apartment once a week to help her with tech stuff because she doesn't know how to, like, charge devices. (laughs) Well, nonetheless, some grandparents could do it. And that's not just me saying it. Business Insider, The Verge, and many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. So... Protect yourself with the VPN that I use and trust. Use my link, expressvpn.com slash check today and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash check. Visit expressvpn.com slash check to learn more. Just don't make me have to say it again. I've said it too many times. Anyway, so Peter Pan, that's number three at the box office. Number four at the box office is an Oscar-winning film Mm. um, that... Uh, is about a place, one a location. Hawaii? No, like a build, like a, a club. I'm going to be honest with you. It's a club. Club Cabana? No, but you know, <laughs> like, uh, yes, a club of that kind of renown. Huh. Um, it won Best Actor, I want to say. Okay. Right? Yes. No. No, I'm sorry. You know what? It was only nominated, but it did win some design Oscars. Huh. Uh, Moulin Rouge? It's Moulin. John Huston's Moulin Rouge mm. with Jose Ferrer and Zsa Zsa Gabor. Yeah. Is Jose uh, Ferrer to lose Lautrec in that? He sure is. Wow. Is he dwarfing it? I don't know. I mean, I assume so, right? Shoes on his knees? He was a very short man, yes. I mean, yeah. didn't Leguizamo do something like that, too? Well, and... but that's Baz Luhrmann. I'm sure he did a version of it that cost $1 million per minute. Well, he so wasn't... Leguizamo was very short. He wasn't he's just not, dwarfing He's it. not quite as short as Lautrec. He wasn't Lutrec, straight dwarfing. But uh, yeah, I've never seen it. I've always wondered about it. Uh-huh. It was a big hit at the time, Moulin Rouge. Yeah. Um, yeah. But obviously, it's mostly about Toulouse Lautrec and all that. Right. That's number four. And number five at the box office. Look. I mean, just tell me. It's about the, the name of the movie. It's, it's like a Hollywood big, uh, big uh, musical. The name of the movie is just the name of a famous author William Shakespeare. No, it's an author who did fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen. Correct. And what does this movie star? This movie stars... Have you ever heard of the movie Hans Christian Andersen? Yes. No, I've seen this. It's Danny Kaye. Danny Kaye. That's right. I've seen this movie. Uh, Farley Granger. I've never seen it. My mother liked it. My my dad really liked Danny Kaye, and I've seen like Walter Mitty and stuff. I've never seen that one. Yeah, Court Jester. I mean, that's the best Court Jester is good. I just remember when we first got a DVD player, like year 2000 or whatever. Yeah. And we had like five DVDs. And my mom was like, I decided to buy a DVD and she put Hans Christian Anderson on the shelf. And I was like, that's number six. Um, like we never had that many VHSs and like suddenly we have DVDs and it's like, oh, we have Nightmare Before Christmas and the Matrix and Blazing Saddles and like a couple things. Then she's like, I'm adding to the shelf. Well, she's allowed. She was, but everyone was like, are you going to watch that a lot? And she was like, maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think she ever did. No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching it with Romilly once though. It's fine. I, I just, I think Walter Mitty and Court Jester were the ones we had on yeah. video or whatever. Court Jester's the one that's like still funny. Yeah. Is Walter Mitty funny? Walter Mitty's got. He has the fantasies. It's, it's fun. got some good sections in it. Right. It's got a good number. Boris Karloff's in it. He's kind of fun. It's got some fun stuff in it. <sighs> I mean, I haven't seen them since I was a kid. Anyway, that's the but box. This is the problem with Walter Mitty is it, people get so obsessed with how to fucking dramatize Walter Mitty. And it's like, he goes on a bunch of dreams without has, stakes. Right. He has his fantasies. Yeah, he he has, has some you know, fun flights little, of fancy. Yeah. All right, some of the other movies in the top 10 this week. There's a movie called Off Limits, okay, uh, which stars Bob Hope, 
We love Bob Hope, right? Yeah, it's a comedy. I'm trying to find out more about it. There's another movie called Off Limits, but that's right. not what I'm looking for. Looking for 1953 Bob Hope and Mickey Rooney. Mm. It's about, oh, Mickey Rooney plays a boxer who's been drafted Wait and second. Hope has to enlist. He's his manager and he has to enlist in the army to keep an eye on him. Hmm. That sounds fun. Yeah, I was getting more excited about the premise. The heightening of it is just his manager also has to go into <laughs> the okay. You know what? Why don't you go fucking make a boxer movie then, <laughs> you dick? Maybe I will. <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> Maybe I will. Um, you've got Trouble Along the Way, which is a okay. movie with... I just feel like we have to talk about it ever, like, briefly, you know, yeah. because it's like we never talk about this no. shit. Um, a movie with... Directed by Michael Curtis, okay. who made a little movie called Casablanca. Curtis. Ever heard was of it? it Curtis. Curtis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, was he Hungarian, I think? Uh-huh. Um, starring that iconic rom-com duo. Give it to John me. Wayne and Donna Reed. Oh, boy. Does that sound fun? Yeah. Those two? Yeah. It's called Trouble Along the Way. Okay. Is it a Western? No. It's like there's, he's, there's like a school that's going to, it's a Catholic school that's in trouble, dire financial straits. Okay. And so the rector has to, who's played by Charles Coburn, has to hire a former big time football coach, John the Wayne, Duke. Yeah. the Duke himself, uh -huh. in the hope of getting a sports program so they can like get some money in, I guess. And it turns out that, uh, I guess Donna Reed is a social worker who's maybe, maybe trying to fight him and they're going to figure it out. I don't know. Again, it sounds kind of complicated. Yeah. It also sounds like this was like the fifties equivalent of kindergarten cop. That's what I'm saying. Where it's like, can we put John Wayne somewhere? He doesn't belong. A school. It's one of those things. Yeah. Right. You'll never believe. I don't know. It's one of those things where they're, they're fighting over, books. over this yeah, and then they sure. eventually it's fall. That John Wayne impression. It's a John Wayne clip from some movie. I don't know the uh -huh. name where it's, him by a lake and there's this kid and I guess they're fishing or something and, uh -huh. and the kid's like I can't swim do you know what I'm talking about no John Wayne's like what do you mean can't swim and then he just takes the kid and throws him in the lake you sure you're not thinking of Frankenstein no I know that this is a John Wayne clip okay all right it's it's highly recommended I'll put the link in the description yeah. please we, we have another movie in the box office called I love Melvin starring <laughs> Donald O'Connor once again, and Debbie Reynolds, reunited Don from Singing in the Rain. Donald O'Connor, the uh, Ryan Reynolds of his day. And in this movie, Donald O'Connor plays a Look magazine photographer. Hey! I think Kubrick saw this and was like, excuse me. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't care. Then there's also I Confess, which I feel like that yeah. was a big movie. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, of the time. That's a Hitchcock, yeah. obviously, mm -hmm. with Mon Monty Clift himself. Mm -hmm. uh, never seen. It's a Hitchcock Neither I've never I. seen. Yeah. And then uh, Bawana Devil is the 10th oh, movie. Oh, yeah. That was the first 3D movie, I believe. I believe uh, that gets credit for being the, the first. It is the first feature-length yeah. 3D film. Um, it's got a lion in it. Uh-huh. Sounds cool. Yeah. Robert Stack. Mm-hmm. Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, yeah. But in this one, the mystery has been solved, and it's lions. Sure. You got to watch out for them yeah. while you're building a railroad. That's I what got, it's about. I got I to watch that someday. Moving on. Yeah, because you're the 3D boy. I love 3D. Fear and Desire makes no money. Stanley Kubrick has no money. Oh, no. No one wants him to make any, you know, movies, right? End of career. Thank you for listening to our miniseries on Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> it would be funny if he was like, forget it. I'll, I'll toothpaste. <laughs> um, so he writes another script. He's like, okay. fuck it. I'll do it myself again. Yeah. And uh, in the contrast to the first one, this one was nothing but action sequences strung together on a mechanically constructed gangster plot. And that's this movie? Well, Or yes. is this a film that doesn't get made? I don't know. Well, let me let me keep going. Because no, the, the, the crucial thing, of course, is in between, he does make the seafarers. Right. He makes on contract for the Seafarers International Union. Right. And uh, this obviously. It's a four hired gig. It's a four hired gig. It's just to make some money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the first time he shoots in color mm -hmm. for the first time, and he won't do it again until Spartacus. Mm -hmm. um, that, but he is starting. I, yes, I think Killer's Kiss is the script that he's shopping around. He eventually raises $40,000. Mm hmm. Uh, mostly coming from a Bronx pharmacist. That's the pharmacist, Thank Morris you. Boussel. Okay, the other one was a drugstore. You know, all right. A candy shop guy, I don't know. Yeah, a no, druggist. A druggist. Uh, and he they got $15,000 from a soda jerk. And they shoot this movie in New York City, guerrilla style. Okay. No permits. Hmm. Any scene you see in this movie that's like on the streets, yeah. and there are a few, they just fucking, you know, 
did it sub Rosa. You know, they were just like, okay, start rolling. You know, like, another uh, just funny thing to contrast with his career ending with Eyes Wide Shut, where he's like, I'm going to fucking make my own New York City. I have no interest in being in the right, streets, streets of New there. York City. I don't yeah. want to deal with those elements at all. So he hires a sound team, this guy. Mm -hmm. Nat Boxer is uh, the lead of his sound team. But then he fires him. Matt Boxer is the lead of his sound team, but also a boxer, the lead of his picture. Very true. But he fires Nat Boxer because he doesn't <laughs> like all his equipment. He thinks the equipment stinks? I guess. He doesn't like all their business. Okay. You know, oh, 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 he's oh, like, oh, I've oh, set up this shot. It. And they're like, well, we need to put a microphone right. there. And Kubrick says, cut. You don't make a movie that way. You guys are all fired. Oh, great. Right. He does the same fucking thing again where they shoot it without sound and dub over every line of dialogue. Yeah, it's crazy. And he, it, once again, he's kind of just doing it all himself. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of the cameras, uh, he's just loading the film himself. I will say the dubbing in both of these films is pretty strong. Yeah, I think you when you watch really... a lot of other movies from this era, it feels a lot more disconnected. Can I say, though, something to the what you're talking about with the sound? Mm -hmm. I feel like I watch still now like contemporary movies and it sounds like shit mm -hmm. in a way where I'm like, is this just kind of continued with film production where sound just kind of gets the short shrift comparatively to the visual aspect? I think everything is generally too rushed these days. And I think the visuals also are being rushed and it's just easier to fix visuals in post than it is to fix sound because the way to fix sound is to re-record it. And often it just sounds inorganic. It, it doesn't. I will say another thing, though, yep. and I think this is a plague, modern plague, uh -huh. is that everything is mixed badly for home, This is where the music is always too loud and the dialogue yes. is always too quiet, and yeah. it's something to do with, you know, I don't know how, like, sports and other TV stuff yeah. is mixed or something, but, like, it's, it's a nightmare. Yes. It really and is. Now, it's the TVs sometimes. will sometimes yes. have sort of, like, cinema mode on sound as well, right. but even, it's not that good. No. And so you can't hear the fucking dialogue, yeah. and then you turn it up, and then someone, like you know, closes a door and it's like, boom! Right, like, right. What the hell? Like, excuse yeah. me. It is, it is another pox of like, I mean, and, and this has affected visuals in a different way, but the sort of like, how do we make things that will play properly on a phone? Like, it's not like they all are designed for the phone, but they need to it's not, at least not thinking on about a phone. the phone. It's the reason why like every Netflix thing has like the look that's like a little too sharp, a little too clean a little too vibrant. Even if it's going for dark and murky, it's like the most vibrant noir you've ever seen. Because it just, everything has to be like so vivid. Kubrick does not like Killer's Kiss much either, right? Uh -huh. He calls it a frivolous movie, amateurish, badly developed, but as you say, he does at least accept it as a film right. he made. No, right? here's what I find surprising and why I called out when you said this was a script he designed to just have all the action beats. Yeah. This movie is so much more of a romance than I thought it would be. Mm. Like, I thought this was going to be just sort of like, well, a guy and people. a girl and a gun and a... Right. right. But this movie is really about, like, her. Yeah, and also the thing... And is, his love of her rather than her being, like, a, a, an element. That's the thing. You keep thinking, like, when will these plots intertwine in right. some plotty way of, like, it turns out she's... I don't know. The like, double cross. You're yeah, for, right. exactly. She's been in on it a lot, all along yeah. or something, and then they fall in You're love anyway. You're waiting for some double indemnity thing. It's like, no, they just live next to each other. Right. right. And they just have this sort of tender romance of they're both kind of like people who've been disregarded by society. They yeah, understand they're, each other. Exactly. They're, they want to stick out, and they're just in the, you know, in the middle of nothing. Yeah, I just feel like even when, when like the love of a good woman the idea of getting out and starting a new life is sort of the motivation for these movies, they're a lot more concerned with the crime and this movie is so much more concerned with the time the two of them spend together and it's it's, it's kind of lovely it's just odd for him to be like and now i'm just gonna design a fucking pot boiler like here's his balls to the wall give you all the meat and potatoes well i guess it's just very and he's not thought of as an emotional filmmaker it's very light on detail right i guess is the way to put it but it does have these kind of tender recollections it has the very long sequence where she talks about her mother in flashback and the woman's dancing and all that it's kind it of an incredible like, super interesting yeah. like yeah. you're really just like this is not some like usual like you say pot boiler thing like, and also more interesting when you consider that's his wife at the time right that's and uh ruth sabaka her whole thing was she was sort of aging out of her dance career 
that's sort of like a swan song for her as a performer. Right, because at this point she's in her 30s, I think, when she's making this movie. Yeah, and she's getting, you know, that's older for, you know, yeah. a ballet dancer. I love the motif kind of with really the other two main characters. You keep seeing everyone's family photos. Yeah. It's like just nice little touch that yeah. humanizes all of them, including the guy who runs, what do they call it, the pleasure the, land? Well, it's the second time this year I we've know. covered a movie about fucking taxi dancers. Yeah, it's true. Uh, weary taxi dancers. Weary taxi looking dancers. Looking for love. Looking for something better. Pestered by crappy guys, yeah. including Frank Silvera, mm-hmm. uh, who Back plays again. the evil Vin. Can I call out one one technique thing I liked in Fear and Desire I forgot to mention? Yeah. When um when when Mazurska accidentally kills the woman. Yeah. She's lying there. And I think it's Silvera who's like checking her body. Yeah. They cut to a POV shot. I know. Of him waving his hand in front of her eyes. It's one of the coolest like little things in the movie. And it's kind not, of a quick yeah. pop. Like you see his hand sort of above her head then you see from her dead pov the hand wave and then it cuts to him like running his hand on her neck checking for a pulse there's something very eerie about it because he's getting at something of like well you usually don't see pov shots of people who are dead but also your role as an audience member is closer to that of a corpse you cannot affect the action of this film you know sure I don't know. No, it's cool. You're right. I thought that was a cool shot. I I feel like there's that, and there was one other shot in Fear and Desire that I thought was cool. Those are the two things that, and I now I don't, and I watched it like yesterday. Yeah. Killer's Kiss. You've got Davey, the boxer, played by Jamie Smith. Mm -hmm. Kind of looks like Kirk Douglas. It's kind of got a Douglassy jaw. Sure. And then you've got Gloria is the taxi dancer, played Mm -hmm. by Irene Payne. Who later becomes one of the early uh, CNN on-screen personalities. Is that true? She becomes oh, yeah. like a, a writer. Yes. She hosted a show called Media Matters, I want to say. Media Watch. Media Watch, sorry. And she wrote a bunch of celebrity autobiographies. Yeah. She wrote one for Betty Ford, Rosalind Right, she Russell. changed her name. She went back to her birth name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chase? Chris Chase. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Or, well, actually, her birth name was Irene Greengard. Weird. But so she, she married a Chase. different names. What okay. can I tell you? But she's pretty good. Yeah. Would you say? Yeah, I liked her in this, yeah. And he's, you know, he's got the right, he cuts the right figure. Yeah. I guess, yeah, right? He's the same he, guy. Yeah. Um, and then you got Frank Silvera. That's kind of it. And like you say, yeah. Sabaka as the dancer in that sort of one amazing sequence. And they just live next to each other, right? He lives in a shitty apartment. Yeah. She lives in a shitty apartment. They look at each other through the window, right? Like, that's the only setup for There's Killer's Kiss. shot that's so good. What is it? Where he's shaving? And then you see his mirror, and you see in the mirror her window. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like the night before the fight, he's like, kind of, you get like a 360 of his room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think at one point, you can kind of see through the mirror her. Right, it's like through the mirror, you see the reflection of her window that he's looking at over his shoulder. It's just a really, it's an interesting like, oh, they're so close, and yet they haven't made that. They haven't breached that line yet, kind of, right. in one shot. Yeah. Because with those air shafts, a lot of times in New York City, I mean, some of them, I've seen people's places where it's like the apartments, like you could reach into yes, the other person's apartment. take shit off their windowsill. Yes. But they're truly in another building. You guys don't have the same entrance. No. Like you're in a no. different building. It's yes. very unusual. But you could, you could fucking throw a soup can with a string over to them and yeah, like, I, right. That was my apartment that I grew up in. You could see yeah. into the next building over there. It's obviously there. not a thing that's only unique to New York, but but These New York is such a yeah. condensed city, yeah. you know? We're all so crammed here. It is that bizarre thing where it's like, uh, especially when you're young and trying to fucking make your way, you're often living in an apartment where your view is of someone else's apartment, and their apartment is a foot away from yours. And as you said, they're in a different building. Where do you think they live? Hmm. Well, a lot of this movie's in Times Square. It is. But that's sort of the place as a business. I think, right. That's just like where they were sort of... But maybe that looks kind of like a tenement. I would like guess like like downtown, east east side. What happens is he's a boxer. He loses a fight, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he wakes up to her screaming and she's being pawed at by Vincent. Pawed at. I like when he pulls down the the, um, blind and it doesn't work. 
And it yeah. goes back up again. And rather than even try it, he just runs off. Remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's also nearing the end of his career. I mean, he's sort of... Davey is nearing the end of his career. Right. Yes. right. He will never be a star boxer. It's not yes. going to happen for right. him. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, it's all downhill from here. And then that's when they finally meet up. And that's when she tells the long life story about her mother and all that. Right. Right. That's, that's that sequence. Right. They, they You know, he sort of... Uh, it comes to her aid, and then there's this really sweet morning breakfast. So, what what are your what were your yeah. parents like? Kind of story swap another, and session. Another small detail is that she watched the fight. Yes, and is familiar with his loss, and I feel like has gotten some information from Vincent. They're both they're both looking to get out of Skid Row. Ooh, Sony Pictures Animation developing an R-rated film from Gen- Gen- Gendi Tartakovsky. Is this fixed or is yeah, this something fixed. else? This was announced like five years ago. Yeah. I'm a little encouraged that they're re-announcing it. This was announced after Hotel Transylvania 3. He said he was going to do that and he was doing, there was a medieval like action movie. The Something Knight. The Black Knight maybe? Mm. And he just signed a, a crazy big Cartoon Network HBO Max deal. Warner Brothers deal. I just want to make another fucking movie. If he makes a movie, we'll cover it on this podcast. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited if it's moving forward. And they're just like, let's go away together, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. like, that's all it really, they share the life stories basically. And then they're just like, let's go to this ranch. Yeah. Up in Seattle or whatever, right? Like that, yes. that's it. It's, they're just going to go away. And so he's like, all right, I'll get the, like my last share of the last fight I did. She's like, I'll get my back pay. And she was also assaulted. By her boss, Vinny, right. who sucks. Mm-hmm. Right. We should say also, this is all being recollected by him in Penn Station. Oh, yes. You get to see gorgeous old Penn Station. Oh, my right. God. Yeah, that's Penn Station, bitch, before we tore it down. Like fucking idiots. I mean, of course, we replaced it with something beautiful. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A tunnel in hell. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. The wor- Truly, it's like, Enter hell to get on a train. That is what current Ben said. But yeah, it used to be this but gorgeous. Hell's cleaner. Hell's cleaner. Right. Hell's actually I mean? better run. Yeah. yeah. Hell, right. they actually give you, they deliver the torture quicker and more efficiently, at least. D- doesn't yes. Kethard have that whole bit about Penn Station saying Giuliani forgot? <laughs> There's one place he didn't get to. <laughs> he didn't get there in time. Sure. Well, now you have the fucking Moynihan Hall, which looks more like this. You do. It's, it's, it's trying, at least, to yeah. bring back, like, hey, you remember light? Natural light? People right. like that to yeah. l- be upon them. Yes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, he's in Penn Station, essentially waiting for a train and waiting for her. Right. So the story's being recounted. It's kind of like, how did I end up like this? Let me tell you. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. With that framing device, you're like, he's going to get fucking stood up. You just feel it. You can feel it in your bones. And when yes. she shows up, it's just like, I don't think this was designed to be the ending of this film. That is true. And the ending was forced on this movie, I think. So that's fair. Because the whole movie is him sort of nervously pacing back and forth. Like, I also feel like at a train station, I just think of like Casablanca or whatever. Like, you're getting on that fucking train alone. Exactly. You know? like, that's just, what I'm saying. Yeah. You're, 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 and you're going to be like, <sighs> and it pulls away and right. the steam's going. Right. If you start the movie with a guy pacing back and forth, worrying about whether or not this connection is real and if she's going to show up and if he's going to be able to get away and have a life of his own. I'm like, you're setting me up for a fucking poetic tragedy. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. You're not setting me up for she's going to run to the station and kiss him and hug him. And the movie ends so abruptly. It does end abruptly. But what else happens? I mean, what else happens before they have the giant fight in the mannequin? The mannequin fight. Like, which is the coolest part of the movie. Like, yeah. I guess it's just like there's a thing in the alleyway. His manager mis- is kind of mistaken for being... For, for being him. For mm-hmm. being him. Mm-hmm. And these two these, thugs... These goons try and rough him up or whatever, right? I mean, they rough him up to yeah. death. Yes. Which they is rough not, him to death. The, ru- the roughest. <laughs> rough him up to death. Hard to get rougher. <laughs> You're right. Um, and so that puts the cops on Davey because they assume, well, he must have killed his manager and taken the sure. money, right? And so then he's got this whole chase where he's he's trying to rescue Gloria, but he ends up in this warehouse filled with mannequins. Uh, and he faces classic off against... classic New York City, only in New York problems. It does feel apt, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like, you know what? Yeah, there's a basin full of mannequins within a mile of here, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My guess is that area is downtown Brooklyn. Could Did be. You think down in like Dumbo or whatever. With the views yeah. of the bridge yeah. mm. and just the the sounds of also because there's a lot of like active piers in those days along that part of Brooklyn's waterfront. Sure. Um, I just feel like if I there's like 
I want to meet that guy today where I'm like, hey, hey, buddy, I got one for you. You're not going to be able to do it. I need 400 mannequins in an hour. And he's like, oh, I know what. I can get you that yeah. in a second. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Over on Star Street. There's a warehouse filled with the things. Yeah. You know, just porcelain, too? Huh? Are they porcelain? Um, They're smashing. They are smashing. I yeah, don't know. You know the problem is the guy today who'd be asking for 400 mannequins would be for a pop-up. <laughs> I'm going to sell artisanal porchetta. Yeah. I need 400 mannequins. I don't know what. It's a, it's a fucking Amazon for your consideration activation or some shit. Yeah. But right, you know, there's still mannequins out there. That's all I'm saying. I think there's mannequins in this city right now. And mannequins are fucking booming. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I bought mannequins recently. Did you really? Why? Of course. For my jeans okay. to display them on. I might, I might. I might want to buy a mannequin off of you. Did you get legs only? Legs only. Fuck, I bought it from a really chill guy on eBay who <laughs> only <laughs> had mannequin parts. <laughs> and let me tell you, the photography... Mr. Mannequin? <laughs> oh, boy. The photography... Because it, 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 it only could have been shot on a digital camera from 15 years ago. It was like the fidelity. <laughs> sure, it, sure. It is terrifying. And uh, I mean, I, I have to respect this person's privacy, but I... Someday would love to show you that uh, gallery of photos, guys. Like, ben, I'm checking your eBay history here. The Robert Durst estate? <laughs> Is you, it like one of those Zillow real estate things where you're like looking at a normal house and it's like kitchen, dining, you know, you're, and there's just uh, four pictures of a basement filled with mannequin legs. <laughs> Skeleton feet. <laughs> I'm just imagining. Comes with the house. Uh, oh, this looks normal. That's where it's in the suburbs of St. Louis. Sure, this makes sense. Mannequin legs, mannequin legs. Mannequin pieces organized by body parts shipped in separate garbage bags. Anyway, the fight's just so cool. That's just the most, I don't know. Yeah. It's so cool. Look, this is not fair, but we recorded this out of order because of guest availability. Yeah, we did the killing And the killing already. fucking rules. The killing kind of just like puts all of this in a cooler package. With yeah. better actors, no yeah. offense to the actors. Yeah. With actors who have real like, you know, right. noir credibility. So like watching Killer's Kiss after Fear and Desire is like, oh, now we're cooking. But if we've just, as we have recently watched the killing before this, it feels like, yeah, give me the give me the fully big for okay. But to kind of get us good back, stuff this, get us back on track, get us to the mannequins. He gets in a cab, yeah, mm -hmm. to follow Vincent, mm -hmm. yeah, and he goes follow that guy, right? I guess they, I don't know if they actually say that, but you know how they always do that in old yeah. movies. Classic yeah. thing to do, classic thing to do, right? And I'm just like, where cabbies just implicit in like crimes and murders constantly yeah because that was just accepted to hey, be like follow paying. that guy i don't know what he wants well also did you just have to was be the there best like a code driver? do you know what i'm saying it's like a hippocratic code almost of like cabbie driving well, where you're I mean, like hey all right i'm just gonna take you where you want to go yeah there I was mean, driver passenger confidentiality <laughs> but like is it like if i got in a cab today and sure. i was like hey follow that you know follow that honda you know civic would he just immediately go like, what? No, I'm sorry. Address, intersection. Yeah, he'd be like, type the address into <laughs> Google Maps. Like, or would, like, how many cabbies right now would just have that kind of old movie instinct where they're like, on it. Like, vroom. Can I throw out a gripe? Okay. One of the benefits of ride sharing, especially in New York City, where you would hail down a yellow cab, and if you were giving them any address that was not numerical, they'd be like, do you know how to get there? Sure. Right. If there wasn't a thing in the grid where you're like 13th and 7th and they're like, I understand the number of moves I have to do in each direction for that. They'd be like, do you know how to get there? And you'd be like, I got to fucking guide you through. I got to be. Yeah, sure. Right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Your Garmin over here. Yeah. A couple times recently, I've gotten like a Lyft or an Uber and then I get in there and they're like, do you know how to get there? I'm like, no, I typed it in. You don't you have, you know, and they're Google. looking at the Google Maps and they're like, so where where is it exactly? And I'm like, where it is on your screen. I don't say it like this. I go, what is this? Is a weird know. gripe though. Like, who's doing this? I don't, I don't know. I look get, in Britain where I grew up in London, England where I grew up. What yes. are you talking? You just talked about your New York City apartment as a boy. I did, but where I grew up in London, uh -huh. London, the cabbies have to do something called the knowledge. Yeah. You know about this? Oh, I do. Where they like ride around on a bike for like two years learning every fucking street. And it 
look, I haven't lived in London in a while, but it well, used to be incredible. Yeah. Because London has no grid system. It has no numbers. Yeah. And you would just get in there and you would say the name of perhaps my favorite named street in London, Cold Bath Square. Cold Bath? Cold Bath Square. There's so many good street names in London. My mom and I would always be, if we ever saw a good one, we'd be like, and we would tell each other yeah. later, but we never topped Cold Bath Square. Wow. We were always like, like, I want to live there. Chimney sweep place? Probably. But the best thing is you would say like Cold Bath Square and they'd be like, oh yeah, right, near to Beauvoir Square. And you'd be like, right. yeah, yes, yes. And you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I know where to get there. You know, like they just knew every fucking street. Well, just so many things about ride sharing uh, suck now, especially the way it's just uh, crushed multiple other types of businesses. You're like, the one clear advantage is it's now hooked. You, uh, you hail it by typing in the address and then they get the sort of route delivered to them. Anytime the driver asks me how to get there, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Well, but I say it like this. Oh, but so as sorry. you were, but wait, this is all set up by Ben saying the guy gets in the cab oh, and the sure. cabbie follows him. Was yeah. there a further point, Ben? Or did you just want to talk it about? It was just setting up the, enterprise how cabbies. in a modern sense, that's ridiculous yes. to do that. That's so like weird. I mean, we like that bit in, uh, with John Braylock in how to be single. Oh, that's, that's so a good funny. Bit. You remember that? No. Where she gets, it's near the end, right? Yeah. Or whatever. It's in her yeah. downswing. Yeah. And she gets in and he, I guess he's, Braylock's the cabbie, right? Yeah. And he says, where to? And she's like, just drive. I believe, I believe she gets in, she's feeling heartbreak. He goes, where to? And she goes, just take me home. And he goes, just, bitch, that's, I don't that's know where you is. live. That's what it is. Yeah. No, it's, I don't know where the fuck you live. I yeah. think. I think he swears. Right. Because right. right? they got Braylock to swear on right. camera. Right. Just take me <laughs> bitch, home. That's what it is. Live. It's so funny. It's like the funniest thing in that entire It's a movie. really good joke. Yes. Yeah. Why in Killer's Kiss, after he defeats Vin in the uh, the mannequin basement, uh-huh. does he, because th- he then is exonerated. I guess it's like he just didn't do it. I guess they just figure it out. Yeah. Because he really seems like he's screwed, you know, when, uh, when they, you know, when they think he killed his manager and all that, like, yeah, but then but he just gets off. Look, David, you have to understand, 1953, there were no cinema sins. What year is this? 55? Did I 55. fuck it up? 55. You fucked it up. There were no cinemas. People weren't pointing out plot holes. You just go. Eh, I'm, I'm not even saying it's a plot hole. I just don't even remember if there's like. I'm saying much it's a plot hole, and I'm saying cinema sense better uh, do fucking killers kiss. They should. They I really mean, should I, take it to task. Ding. Yeah, I think it's the the witnesses of the two guys. Uh, are like it wasn't him. It was it yeah. was these two guys. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's when he's like, well. I'm going to buy a train to Seattle. Mm-hmm. He doesn't think she's going to come, and at the yeah, end, buy she train does. I want to kill her. He's not buying an entire choo choo train. No, you're right. He's not buying a train. train. He buys one ticket to Seattle. Yes. And then Hope she shows up right at the end of the kiss. The yeah. end. Happy yeah. ending. That was the titular. It truly was a killer's kiss. <laughs> I guess so, right? I right. mean, he does kill Vin. Yeah. So he is a killer. Yeah. What are we forgetting about killer's kiss? Nothing really. The things I really love are that flashback with the dancing yeah, mom. That's the best sequence. And the the fucking mannequins. That those yeah. both are really good. Yeah. And I just went to see it at the film forum like when I was twenty five and I had a great time. Hey, that's look, what I remember about. Best Killer's thing Kiss. about these two movies combined a cool two hours and five minutes. That's true. Yeah. Nice to knock two movies out. What's his longest movie? I think it two thousand one. Two thousand one ain't short, that's for sure. Oh, I have something I wanted to talk about really yeah. quickly. Mm-hmm. The elevator. Long. Normally, well, I just want to show the long. Normally, I like things when they're slow. Sure, Christmas. But that elevator, boy, oh boy! If I had to live in those times, yeah, I'd be pissed. That shit looks like it takes forever. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was, well, people David, would, things moved slow back then. It's like the Oregon everyone Trail. just was cool with that. People would die. Everyone was cool with everything being yeah, slow. Old age. It was a slower time. Maybe that's the problem with these days. Everything's moving too fucking fast. Now, 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 now. Maybe we need to all take a break and take in the elevator. We're all all on our phones. We're all looking down at our right, man. His longest film, by the way, is Spartacus, which is three hours and like 12 minutes long. I forgot that Spartacus is like a classic Hollywood epic. Can we push back the recording on that one? No. (laughs) It's next Friday. I know I'm we doing the bit I of know, already acting bit. like I started the movie too late. Yes, he's just oh, he's done that the so episode many times. into two parts. Just now decide that. Yeah, three. Three parts. Just just stretch it out. Does it have an intermission? I don't know, but probably. Okay. I haven't seen it in a while. I do have the steel. Do you have the steel? I got the steel. Good for you. Um, Thank you. Sporadicus. Um, good for you as well. Yeah. 
Of course. Uh, let's see the box office game for Keller's okay. Kiss. How long have we been running, Ben? Uh, it says you're long enough. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> Number one at the box office in October, the you know, 5th of October or whatever, 1955, is a movie I've never heard of. Okay. Uh, it's a war film, mm-hmm. account of World War II, okay. um, based on a soldier's autobiography. Hmm. And it stars the author of that book as himself. It stars a real soldier. Wow. Yes. And he became a truly famous actor. Huh. Very interesting figure. Uh, made 21, I wouldn't made lots of movies, not 21 movies, 21 year acting career. Okay. Mostly did Westerns apart from this. Huh. Uh, had PTSD, slept with a handgun under his pillow, struggled with pills later in life. But uh, but was was a famous sort of post war figure. His name is Audie Murphy. Oh sure, heard of him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he wrote a book called "To Helen Back." Oh, oh, I know that title. And that's yeah. this movie. Okay, wow, wow. Yep. Never uh, directed it. by Jesse Hibbs. I did not know that's what that movie was, or mm-hmm. but that was his background. That's wild. Uh, big and this hit. is after Best Years of Our Lives. Yeah, because right? Best Years of Our Lives is very. It's like forty six or something. It's like yeah. very shortly after the war. Right. Uh, and that movie is, if no one's, you know, people haven't seen it, incredible and really that's, worth watching. That's like one of the best American films ever. Yes. In my opinion. This is, I have not seen, but I think more of like a straightforward, like action picture. Okay. Just with the grit of like, this is basically It's like on that fucking, fucking real Act war. of Valor movie or whatever where they were like, the soldiers are real. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, that's what it's like. It was inspired by that movie, actually. Great. Uh, no. They were anyway. Time machine. Number one at the box office is that. Okay. Number two mm-hmm. is one of those it was like one of the highest grossing movies of the year okay it's one of those movies 55. that's literally just footage of vacations that you could take in europe god is it called this is europe it's called cinerama holiday that was going to be my second fucking guess okay i know that title um yes cuz you know there those the cinerama was like yes the uh the wide screen well it's multiple right, uh, it's right. like a dome. it's like three screens and it's, it's sort of like curved screens, three right i've never done it curved um, uh, and yeah, and they would make these Cinerama movies that were just like our great national parks. Uh, right. And you just sit there and you couldn't believe how this thing looked. This one is much like the ones you're describing. Mm-hmm. Emphasis on spectacle and scenery. Sure. Uh, a bobsled ride. Okay. A landing on an aircraft carrier. Cool. So it's truly just fucking cool photography. Right. It, but it is called Cinerama Holiday, so it is it was supposed to be about holidays you can yeah. take. I mean, I don't know how many fucking holidays involve you landing on an aircraft carrier. Uh, sounds like a proto Soren. Number three at the box office uh-huh. has just a great title. Just a fucking bananas good title. Oh, uh, Casper, Spirit of Beginning. <laughs> it's a John Wayne picture. Okay. Once again, Mr. Wayne is coming up in the box office. Lauren Bacall. <sighs> Fuck. Pretty good pairing. Yeah. It's a Cold War movie, and it's set in China. And I think it's about, like, Chinese communists. Wow. And uh, it's sort of like him fighting the Soviets, maybe on the side of the Chinese? I'm not sure. What's it called? I'm not going to guess this title. It's a William Wellman film. It's called Blood Alley. Pretty cool title. Fuck. Ben's eyes went wide. Um, What a good name. Yeah. One of those movies where... uh, it clearly has Asian characters, right? Yes, Chinese characters. Of yes. And I'm scanning the cast list um, here, and I'm not seeing a lot of Chinese names. Eli Wallach. <laughs> Barry Kroger mm-hmm. as Old Feng. I'm guessing not a Chinese guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, I've never seen it. Uh, okay. Never really heard of it. No, that's a good title. Uh, but apparently it was an early movie for Anita Ekberg. Oh, sure. Uh, who has a, young, a small role in that. Uh, a lot of yellow face. Oh, including her. Great, cool. Great, cool. Great, anyway. fantastic. <laughs> hey, look, it's the 50s box office game, baby. I yeah. take what I get. <laughs> Vacation movies, racist John Wayne shit. Look, number four. Racist John Wayne shit was kind of the Marvel Cinematic Universe <laughs> of its time. Number four at the box office yeah. is um, a Humphrey Bogart film that I've never seen. I have heard okay. of it. I've never seen it. It's about, um, like, he has to masquerade as a Catholic priest. Um, I think it's, it's also it's, set in China. It's not, uh, what, what's it called? We're No Angels? No, it's not that. That is a Bogar movie where he has to pretend to be a priest, though, but right? But it's not that. I know, but I just want I to mean, confirm. Yes, and there was re- wasn't We're No Angels then remade as... Uh, there you go, yes. Yeah. And you are, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, a bogey so movie. Sometimes I'm right about it. But something. you know what? 
This Even is set at a small American mission in China in 1947 at a time huh. of civil war. And Humphrey Bogart plays a hunted man masquerading as a Catholic priest. And Gene Cherney plays a nurse. Lee J. Cobb and Agnes Moorhead and E.G. Marshall are all in it. And those are all good actors. It's called... It's called The Left Hand of God. Okay. I've never, I've never seen it. No. I love Bogey. Yeah. Uh, and apparently it got bad reviews. Mm-hmm. Number five of the box office. Mm-hmm. It's a Hitchcock. It's a Hitchcock in 55. Not one of his best, in my opinion. Okay. But a movie star movie. Is it a Stewart? No. Hmm. Who's the other one? Grant. It's a Grant. Cary Grant himself. Mm-hmm. Archie Leach to his friends. Well, wow. What's his name? Ugh. Good thing he changed it. <laughs> he, you. <laughs> yeah, but what about a guy called Cary Grant? Interested? Very. <laughs> Uh, Cary Grant, he's opposite a Hitchcock Bond, one of the most iconic ones. Uh, not Grace Kelly. It is Grace Kelly. It is Grace Kelly. And what's the movie they made together? Why am I fucking blanking? It's one, in, in my opinion, it's one of his more boring movies. I, I've seen it. I've never loved it. Is it it's uh, very pretty? Sus- suspicion? It's not Suspicion. That's a great movie. Who's in Suspicion again? Isn't it Inger Bergman? Yeah, you're oh, right. I've seen Suspicion. Uh, it's not Spellbound, right? It's not Spellbound. That's Joan Fontaine in Suspicion. It's Ingrid Bergman is an inter- notorious. Okay. Know, what a fool I am. And Spellbound is Bergman as well with Gregory Peck, I think. Right, right, right. Uh, Spellbound I haven't seen. I just haven't seen it so long. But what the fucking movie is this? Why am I not putting this together? Well, it's Cary Grant playing a cat burglar. Does that help? What's another term for cat burglar? Oh, it's a catch a thief? A thief. Duh, you got to catch him. I know. I, why, why did I not fucking get because that? Because that's okay. not one of Hitchcock's better movies. And yeah, no one, that movie's you know. fun, though. It's fun-ish. It's fun-ish. It's fun-esque. It's very, you know, it's a, everyone it's looks amazing. It's a movie star movie. Great gowns. Yeah. Good hair. Yeah. Nice locations. It's set in the French Riviera. Yeah. yeah. I just remember when I was in my true, like, teen Hitchcock sure. shows of watching them all, that one, I was kind of like, you know those ones where Cary Grant's like, well, I think you're great. You're just like, you know. No, so you know doesn't. Like, he's getting a little old for this shit. It doesn't super feel like a Hitchcock movie. It's a le- little less Hitchcock. It feels little, like Hitchcock it's a little lighter. directing a Cary Grant film rather than Cary Grant being in a Hitchcock movie. Some other movies in the top ten. Mm-hmm. Jane Russell and Jeanette Crane in Gentleman Mary Brunette, which was sort of a sequel to Gentleman Prefer Braun. I don't think I knew that was a sequel. Well. Also, a little yeah. rude to just tell brunettes that they're the consolation prize. Well, there's also a film called Ulysses that is an adaptation of The Odyssey, an Italian film starring Kirk Douglas. That sounds cool. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, also, Anthony Quinn. Uh-huh. So. Okay. You know, that's yeah. cool. Uh, there's also I Am a Camera, which oh, is, yeah. of course... Uh, the what Julie Harris movie that will eventually become cabaret, inspire the cabaret, size into cabaret. Yes, yes, sure. About the Berlin stories, fascinating, um, which are interesting. And uh-huh. then you've got something called the Shrike. Mm. Uh, Jose Ferrer stars David? and directs. <laughs> what? And <laughs> do something dramatic. <laughs> David pulled his microphone off the table, leaned it. I'm getting sleepy. Uh, which sounds kind of cool. I'm getting sleepy too. Yeah. Uh, and the cat, you know, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Sure. Um, but yeah, I don't know. A uh, successful stage director driven to a mental breakdown. Okay. Sounds fun. And then something called the McConnell story. Not about Mitch. Uh, no, it's about someone called Joseph McConnell, who is a, an Air Force pilot. Okay. So a lot of World War II shit, you yeah. know, still in the air. Starring Alan Ladd. Alan Ladd. Uh, you know, senior. Senior. Uh, him, him of shame. You know. Yeah. So that's the top 10. Okay. Look, we'd love to talk about the fucking, uh, you know, 50s is a golden age of cinema, but then you realize there's a lot, of, a lot of programmers came out. Well, that's what's interesting about the box office game back then. Yes. Right. You're like, oh, well, we think of X movie. Oh, these are the, but of course they were not the biggest sellers. Right. They're movies yes. that both are completely forgotten and movies that are literally lost to time. Sure. That just like aren't in circulation anymore and we never talk about them. And they only exist as like, oh, this was one of six movies that movie star made that year. Right. Like it's just a title on a list. No one ever wants to think, talk about how gentlemen marry brunettes, but they do. They do. Okay. We're done. How long has it been? It says here, stop. <laughs> it, it says stop. To stop. It just yeah. says stop. It says stop. Wait, Ben, did you press stop? <laughs> oh, no. Okay, it's still going. <laughs> hey, look. Next week, 
Yeah. The we killing. We recorded it already. The killing. With Pat Oswald. Hey. Fucking corker of a guest. And good episode. I, I think. think good episode. Yeah. yeah. For I a think. Zoom app? Yeah. 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 We had some tech difficulties, but I think, I think we'll comment together in the edit, right? Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's great. Good it's a good episode. Fun conversation. It's just. Three. And a banger of a movie. It's a movie that rules, and yeah. also the three of us just dorking out so fucking hard. About, oh like, gosh. you know, 50s noir guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. for yeah, sure. Talking hot. talking greasy on Victor Mature. Oh, man. It I'm gets what? deep. It gets yeah, deep. Yeah, it was a good time. So yeah. that's next week. That's next week. And this was this week, and the episode's over. Thank God. I know. It's hot in here. You know what I don't like? Summer. <sighs> I like things about it. I, I don't always love the heat. think I like it more than I do when yeah. it comes. Well, this is why we're going to have air conditioning in our office. God damn it, Ben. We will. You we're guys. not fighting on this. We're all on the same page. It's I know, I know, I know. a must. Uh, and, and Olaf, as far as I'm concerned, that guy's crazy. Is that it? So much for the birds. Oh, sure. Yeah. Olaf is crazy. I Olaf is crazy. Look, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Ben for putting the air conditioning on. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and helping put together the show. Alex Barron, AJ McKeon for our editing. Pat Reynolds, Joe Bowen for our artwork. Thank you to JJ Birch for our research. Did a lot of goddamn work for this episode. Get two movies and all the table setting for Kubrick. Thank you, JJ. JJ continues to kill it. And we're never, ever going to mention on Mike how late he sends us the dossiers. Not late like like they're overdue, like he just sends them at odd hours of the night. But we're not going to mention it. We're never going to talk about it because he already has told us he gets self-conscious when we do it, so we're not mentioning it ever again. Thank you to Lane Montgomery and the Great American Owl for our theme song. You can go to patreon.com slash blank check for blank check special features. We do commentaries on franchises like the Roger Moore James Bond movies, but we're also going to do a bunch of Kubrick bonuses. So I think we're going to do 2010. We're thinking 2010. We're thinking Dr. Sleep. Hell yeah. yeah. And Get we got hats. And we got a Kubrick themed talk in the walk coming later this year. That's all I'll say about that. Go to Blank Check Pod for links to some real nerdy shit. Killing next week with Pat and Oswald. And as always, Ben bought mannequins from the Robert Durst estate. Do you want to dispute it? Yeah. What's what's up, Ben? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, okay. Literally. Um, anyway. <laughs> We're talking about uh I don't know, killer's kiss. Literally nothing. <laughs>